So Tess, uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. With the roll call, please. Commissioner Conway. Here. Dawson. Here. Gordon. Here. Maxwell. Here. C.D. Miller. Here. Paul Hamus. Here. Chair Kennedy. Here. Uh, great, thanks everybody. So are there any statements of disqualification on agenda items this evening? Hearing none, we'll move on to our public hearing. We don't need to do oral communications because it's a special meeting. So I'd like to open the public hearing on item number one, which is um, 113 and 119 Lincoln Street. <clears throat> um, Tim, you wanna give us a staff presentation? Sure. Good evening, uh, everybody. Um, good evening, Chair Kennedy and members of the Planning Commission. Um, my name is Tim Mayer, Senior Planner with the City. This evening's first agenda item is um, review of the proposed development of the Downtown Library Affordable Housing Project located at 113, 119 Lincoln Street. So I'd, I'd like to confirm that my uh, PowerPoint presentation is visible. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so requested is approval of several project entitlements, including a non-residential demolition authorization permit, a special use permit, a design permit, and a lot line adjustment. The proposed project includes demolition of the existing surface uh, parking lot and structures and construction of the library mixed use affordable housing project. So as proposed, the project would include a new approximately 273,194 square foot, eight story building encompassing a three story, approximately 38,069 square foot city library, a three story parking garage with 243 parking spaces, a five story, 100% affordable housing component with 124 residential units, a three story, a roughly 9,598 square foot commercial tenant space, one story, 1,231 square foot childcare facility with adjoining 674 square foot outdoor play area and new landscaping and associated site improvements, uh, such as an expansion of the existing sidewalk, continuation of an on-street bicycle lane and placement of planters, landscaping and city street trees. This evening, the planning commission is, is requested to make a recommendation to the city council regarding the requested entitlements. Please note that the role of the Planning Commission this evening is not to make a decision regarding the appeal of the heritage tree removal permit associated with the project, which will be heard um, at the City Council at an upcoming hearing. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce city staff who have played a role in review and design of the proposed project. The city's economic development department holds the lead role in spearheading the design of the project for consistency with city council directives. Uh, Bonnie Lipscomb is the Executive Director of the Economic Development Department, and Brian Borguno is the Development Manager and Project Manager for the project. Yolande Wilburn is the Director of Santa Cruz Public Libraries and has played the lead role in library design. Uh, as mentioned earlier, my name is Tim Mayer. I'm the point of contact for applications related to a project entitlement. Department of Public Works staff include Nathan Nguyen, Director of Public Works, Matt Starkey, Transportation Manager, and Claire Gl um, Gologli, who is the Transportation Planner. The owner's representative and representative Griffin Structures is Tom Ottenstein, uh, project executive. Uh, representative of the applicant and the lead contact for the affordable housing developer is uh, and development partner is Mr. Jim Rendler, uh, principal and vice president of For the Future Housing. Dixie Boss is director of real estate development with Eden Housing, which is the affordable housing partner. And the project architects for the overall building, including the Corn Shell, commercial tenant space, and childcare facility include uh, Frank Thaxter and Jesse Skidmore of Tenover Architects. And the library master architect is Abe Jason with Jason Architecture. Shown on this slide is the project site bordered in red. The subject site is an approximately 66,921 square foot or 1.54 acre roughly rectangular area consisting of two adjacent lots located in the city's central business zone district or CBD zone district. As seen here, the site is bounded by a Lincoln Street to the north, Cedar Street to the west, Cathcart Street to the south, and an alley to the east. Uh, neighboring land uses include commercial buildings to the north, south, and east, a Calvary Episcopal Church to the west, 
along with commercial establishments along with Pacific Avenue and Front Street. As mentioned, the project site is composed of two adjacent parcels with a total of approximately 66,921 square feet or 1.54 acre site um, composed of the two adjacent parcels. One of the two parcels, the parcel address 113 Lincoln Street, is considered substandard for the dimensions and size of the lots required in the Central Business District and is proposed to be combined with the larger of the two lots, which is address 119 Lincoln Street. The entire project site lies within the Central Business District, which is its zoning designation. The southwest corner of the project site is included in the city's floodplain overlay district. Uh, the project site has a general plan uh, designation of RBC or um, Regional Visitor Commercial, which di um, directs the overarching vision of the project site and includes regulations, including, among others, a maximum floor area ratio of 5.0 by virtue of its uh, location with this, the city's um, downtown area. The site is located within the area of the Central Business District governed by the city's downtown plan, which contains regulations related to land use and building design, including building height, among other standards. The site is located primarily in the Cedar Street Village Corridor sub-area of the downtown plan. Um, it's shown here on the right-hand side of the screen of the four uh, distinct sub-areas of the downtown plan land area. Um, the site is located primarily in the Cedar Street Village Corridor, like I mentioned. Uh, with an approximately 10 foot wide swath of the easterly portion of this project site located within the Pacific Avenue Retail District sub area of the downtown plan. However, for the purpose of project evaluation, the project design was assessed relative to its consistency with the criteria of the Cedar Street Village corridor in which it primarily lies. This slide um, provides a pictorial representation of the existing site, including the existing commercial building shown here at the top in this kind of rectangular area at 113 Lincoln Street and the par uh, parking lot um, existing uh, designated as city's uh, parking lot number four, which is addressed 119 Lincoln Street, which um, occupies basically the rest of the project area. Uh, both the commercial building at 113 Lincoln Street and the parking lot at 119 Lincoln Street are proposed to be demolished to accommodate the downtown library affordable housing project. Shown here is a view of the existing lot as seen from the corner of Cedar Street and Cathcart Street at the southwest corner of the project site. Um, the existing city surface parking lot, again called uh, lot number four, can be seen here along with the condition of the existing streets and sidewalks. And the prominent commercial building and surrounding retail uh, can be also seen on this slide. This slide presents a view of the project site as seen from its northwest corner at the intersection of Cedar Street and Lincoln Street. Um, the existing total fitness building at 113 Lincoln Street is visible here. Again, visible in this slide is a view of the concrete block uh, commercial building located at 113 Lincoln Street, which is currently occupied by Total Fitness, a body fitness studio. Uh, the adjacent alley and public right away additionally appear here. Again, a view of the existing um, conditions of the site appear here from the vantage point, this time of its southeasterly corner looking west. The foreground here shows the existing driveway entry and commercial building, while the background provides context of the existing site, which is presently used for surface parking owned and managed by the city. This slide shows the site as seen from Cathcart Street, including the existing midweek level of activity on site. And this uh, slide um, depicts a photo that was taken just a couple of days ago. Another view of a very recent photo um, included appears here. and is visible, the lot sits mostly vacant during the day, midweek. This slide shows existing conditions, this time from Cedar Street. Um, city street trees can be visible, uh, can be seen here. Under current conditions, the bike parking lane along Cedar Street uh, does not quite continue all the way along the frontage um, along Cedar as shown uh, the, the termination around the uh, point of this vehicle. This slide illustrates the conditions of the project site, um, including the building at 113 Lincoln Street and adjacent on-street parking. Again, just providing context of the existing conditions. The slide here um, again returns to a view of the lot from Lincoln Street at the southeast corner of the lot. Uh, the lot sits again mostly empty and existing and new development are visible beyond a Cedar Street to the east of the project site, excuse me, to the west of the project site. Just a brief background of the history of the site. Um, the original development of 113 Lincoln Street occurred approximately 80 years ago 
City records show that the existing reinforced concrete uh, commercial building was constructed in 1941. The building was subsequently converted to a health clinic in 1980, and an addition um, of an interior second story took place in uh, 2013. Um, issuance of a demolition permit and building permit for tenement improvement facilitated the adaptive reuse of the building as a health fitness studio in that same year. Uh, the adjacent parcel at address 119 Lincoln Street was formerly occupied by a commercial building constructed in 1940 for Safeway Stores Incorporated. Um, the existing parcel, of course, is a city-owned surface parking lot number four of the city's downtown parking district. Um, efforts leading to proposed redevelopment of the subject site began over a decade ago. In 2012, the Santa Cruz Public Libraries uh, system initiated a comprehensive facilities master planning process, which culminated in preparation of the library facilities master plan in 2014. Later in June of 2016, passage of countywide measure S supplied funding to upgrade, modernize, construct, and expand library facilities throughout the county, including those within city limits. On January 25th of 2018, the city's downtown library advisory committee which was formed as an advisory uh, body to the city council, adopted the recommendation of the downtown branch library and formally recommended inclusion of the new downtown library in a, quote, joint use project with a parking garage on the city-owned property on Cedar Street, end quote, and identified the project site as a, quote, ideal location, end quote, for a new library facility. In 2019, the city council voted to direct formation of the downtown library subcommittee is a subgroup of the city council, again, responsible for evaluating project alternatives in collaboration with library staff and city residents. From May of 2019 to June of 2020, the downtown library subcommittee engaged the community, including both key stakeholder groups and the broader public, and solicited uh, residents' feedback regarding the potential for formation of a new library facility, including potential for placement within a mixed-use development format. On June 23rd of 2020, the city council uh, proceeded with the development of a mixed-use library project, including a new modern library, affordable housing component of minimally 50 units, and a parking facility with up to 400 parking stalls at parking lot number four, located at 119 Lincoln Street. On December 4th of 2021, the City Council accepted the updated concept design presented by the project team and li library master architect following a series of community workshops and further directed to move forward with the schematic design. On May 10th of 2022, Library Master Architect and Project Team presented to the City Council an update uh, illustrating the schematic design and presenting commu community feedback received from additional community meetings regarding the plans prepared and detailed the anticipated budget for construction of the project as proposed. So as you can see through this slide, there's been an, an extensive uh, period of public comment and involvement related to the design of the project stretching back now over 10 years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, many opportunities for public feedback have been included in development of the project. From 2019 to 2020, the library master architect engaged in a months-long community outreach process to solicit input regarding aspects of a conceptual library of value to the community, including a diversity of community stakeholders and resident demographics. Uh, feedback was compiled and informed design of the facility. Following the architect's development of conceptual plans, the city and project uh, design team again engaged the community through a series of workshops over a period of months regarding preliminary project design, including the library's exterior facades, site and roof plans, preliminary interior configuration, and other aspects of the project. Those engagement efforts resulted in modification of the proposed design to increase the number of affordable housing units to as many as 125 and to conceptualize a new library oriented towards Cedar Street and enclosing approximately 40,000 square feet of pro programmable space um, with 35,000 square feet of indoor area and 5,000 square feet of exterior terrace or deck connecting the library's interior to the building's rooftop. Coordination among members of the community, project architect, and city staff produced a preliminary design featuring five stories of affordable housing placed above three stories of parking with a parking stall count reduced from 400 to 310 stalls to accommodate a greater number of affordable housing units. The schematic project designs were then presented to the city council and the council reviewed and approved the schematic design at a meeting on December 14th of 2021. So again, just reiterating the extensive public outreach process involved with this project. Um, so fast forwarding kind of to more recent times, um, subsequent to all of the previously mentioned activity, 
The pre-application for the proposed project was submitted in September of uh, 2022. In accordance with the city's community outreach uh, policy for planning projects, a community engagement meeting was held on September 21st from 6 to 7.30 p.m. At the meeting, um, the applicant, including staff of the city's economic development department, affordable housing developer, and project architects, delivered a presentation providing an overview of the scope of the project and design of the project and responded to questions during and follow the pre following the presentation. Uh, approximately 66 members of the community attended, including various city officials, um, participants questions varied uh, centering primarily on aspects of the project related to availability of plans and project reports programming design of the library the number of residential units and the nature of the residential units and structured parking anticipated street and sidewalk improvements uh, credit of the residential units to the city's regional housing needs allocation or arena numbers consistency of the proposal to the general plan and zoning designations uh, and state density bonus law availability of parking, impacts associated with parking demand, and so on. Uh, finally, on November 8th of 2022, a formal application was submitted uh, related to the proposed project. The formal application for the project generally reflects the design as previously submitted in the pre-application. The project includes an eight-story building with a new three-story library having approximately 38,069 square feet um, of interior area featuring two floors, double heighted with elevated ceilings and a 3,240 square foot uncovered rooftop terrace. The 124 unit housing development would include a mix of unit types, including um, a five-story residential component with 13 studio units, 48 one-bedroom units, 32 two-bedroom units, 31 three-bedroom units, all ranging in size from 344 to 957 square feet. The development also includes a three-story, approximately 9,598 square foot commercial tenant space designed to accommodate a range of tenant types, as well as a one-story, approximately 1,231 square foot childcare facility. Um, the project would include at grades uh, structured parking with 243 parking stalls. This building, uh, excuse me, this slide shows the proposed site plan. Um, as can be seen here, um, pardon. As can be seen here, the building envelope would occupy nearly the entirety of the project site in order to accommodate project goals as directed by the city council and, it, and therefore necessitates uh, maximum efficiency of space utilization of the site. The project includes frontage improvements along Cathcart Street, Cedar Street, and Lincoln Street for city standards, including curb, gutter, and expanded sidewalks. The proposed sidewalks will be built 10 to 12 feet wide, consistent with the downtown plan uh, specifications which require a minimum width of 10 feet along Cedar Street, but encourages wider sidewalks and east-west streets to encourage pedestrian use. Now, the width of the sidewalk varies due to improvements in street curvatures, but in general provides a 12-foot wide sidewalk along Cedar Street and Lincoln Street, and again, a 10-foot wide sidewalk along Cathcart Street. The project um, also includes four loading and unloading parking spaces along Cedar Street in this area over here, um, and a five on-street parking spaces along Lincoln Street, and a bus stop shown over here would be provided on Cedar Street just north of its intersection with Cathcart Street over here. So here is the existing um, proposed bus uh, stop location. Uh, staff of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District have reviewed the proposed location and have expressed support for the bus stop as is proposed. This slide shows the ground floor of the building as designed. Uh, the library's footprint would occupy 17,914 square feet as shown in orange here. And the commercial uh, child care space is shown in yellow. Uh, the first floor of commercial space um, is shown in red, is, uh, visible here. And the ground floor of the parking garage is shown in gray. The project's second level appears here. The ground floor of the library includes a double-heighted ceiling. So um, it's shown as open to below in the slide. The commercial tenant space again appears in red and it occupies um, the second floor as um, presented in this layout in the second uh, story. And the second level of the parking is additionally shown. This slide shows the third level of the building, which again, largely echoes the layout of the two levels below. The commercial tenant space on the third floor occupies a larger share of the uh, building at this level. This slide depicts the building's fourth floor. Uh, the new green roof is aligned to the building's primary frontage here on Cedar Street, including landscaping to soften the appearance of the building and blur the hard edge of the building's cap along Cedar Street. The covered mezzanine uh, provides 
access to the uncovered rooftop terrace shown over here um, as the library patio. The first level of the residential units can additionally be seen here shown in uh, pale and, and darker blue. And again, a mix of unit types, including studio one, two and three bedroom units, along with rooftop residential amenities such as community patio, a tot lot and landscape usable open space appear um, faded kind of in gray. So community patio, tot lot, landscaping, kind of a meandering pathway here. Uh, the project's fifth and sixth floors, identical in layout, are shown on this, on this slide. And significant offsets in planes accommodate units of various sizes and, again, add articulation for visual interest of the building. The building's seventh and eighth floors are shown here, again, occupied by residential units. The building's elevation as viewed from Cedar Street appears on this slide. Uh, consistent with the design standards of the Cedar Street Village Corridor and as specified in the downtown plan, the building provides ground level treatment with primary accesses along Cedar Street, accentuating the building's points of entry. Uh, the main library entrance is shown here and provides, again, uh, transparency at ground level to allow visibility to the building's interior, creating a sense of activity and vitality and incorporates plentiful glazing. So the entirety of the um, second and third levels here um, are all glass. Uh, the building incorporates offset planes formed by various projections and curved recesses and a regular arrangement of windows. And the residential building component is set back significantly, shown kind of transparent here in the background uh, from Cedar Street and physically separated from the library, the commercial tenant space, and the childcare components to facilitate ready access while maintaining privacy and separation from those public components. This slide illustrates the south elevation of the building or its view from Cathcart Street. A step back facades with trim at cap accents break up the building's mass and provide an element for horizontal emphasis and a color scheme of muted orange, beige and gray applied to the exterior wall surfaces um, create a subtle contrast to the surrounding building uh, while ensuring visual harmony with the appearance of the existing site and the surrounding land uses. This, the building's north elevation appears here um, visible from Lincoln Street uh, pro provisions of the downtown plan, the parking structure facade serves as a compatible visual extension of the, the first levels of the uh, library building and avoids placement of any sloping uh, floor elevation adjacent to public streets. Um, so the parking facility has been set back from the ground floor commercial uses and is directed by the design criteria of the Cedar Street Village corridor, although the lower levels of the library facade show long continuous strips of glass um, they use frit patterns and regular grid um, uh, fenestration pattern of um, gridded network avoids a monotonous presentation and openings have been thoughtfully integrated with the garage and residential buildings to appear as well proportioned windows rather than long continuous um, uh, stretches of glass. Um, decorative screen and trellis elements are additionally incorporated and provide variation and in interest to the facade. Um, as promoted by the downtown plan, the proposed parking structure, as shown below here, um, would play an important role in providing parking facilities for surrounding land uses um, along with Pacific Avenue and to surrounding downtown destinations. At the easterly half of the site, um, the five-story residential component um, rises above the parking garage as visible on the bottom here. And again, um, incorporates a concrete base and three-tone integral uh, stucco with metal a trim exterior. And again, um, the consistency with the Cedar Street Village corridors of the um, downtown plan are presented throughout the design. As proposed, the project includes a three-story structure parking facility, as I mentioned earlier, with a capacity for 243 parking stalls. Um, as stated in the downtown plan, uh, parking facilities are required to step down to 35 feet adjacent to the street, which is accorded uh, uh, provided with a 33 foot um, height as incorporated in the project design. Uh, pedestrian access to the residences would occur from Cathcart Street uh, and Lincoln Street and pedestrian access to the parking garage would occur adjacent to the vehicular entries over um, this portion of the slide. Um, and along the building's south, or, uh, south, south elevation, excuse me, as well as the project's north side over here at the approximate midpoint of its Lincoln Street frontage into the commercial tenant space from Cathcart Street. So all points of pedestrian access. Emergency vehicle access and service access would occur through the one-way alley, kind of in the back of the lot over here, uh, proceeding north from Cathcart Street 
um, to Lincoln Street and align with the city's, uh, excuse me, the site's easterly property line. The lights just went out here. Um, as proposed, the parking garage entry um, uh, would be recessed as shown here, kind of visible, and an open air design with support pillars would provide exiting vehicles with clear uh, lines of sight um, in both directions and provide adequate sight distances for both oncoming vehicles and pedestrians uh, for exiting vehicles. Um, early considerations of the design for the parking capacity um, aim to achieve project objectives as directed by the city council um, and led staff to uh, consider design proposals with parking capacity for up to 400 parking stalls Following review of the site plan by the police and fire department and through iterative um, architectural revisions, the overall parking capacity has been reduced to its present supply of 243 stalls. Um, as a public parking facility with access by a range of vehicle types anticipated, 116 of the 243 stalls are standard size stalls with dimensions of eight and a half by 19 feet. Um, 15 stalls are reserved for electric vehicles. Um, uh, eight are accessible stalls and 117 are compact stalls uh, for a total of 48% of the uh, project uh, parking capacity. The proposed configuration is intended to maximize total capacity while integrating larger standard size stalls as uh, possible for a sufficient number to minimize congestion and delays. Additionally, um, bicycle parking capacity of a total of 240, 258, excuse me, um, bike parking spaces are strategically placed throughout the site, uh, including both lockable storage um, throughout the perimeter of the project, as well as um, non-lock storage. This project is required to have a total of 129 class one bike parking spaces, 124 for residential use and five for commercial use. <coughs> the project, excuse me. <coughs> the, the project is required to have a total of 68 class two bike parking spaces, uh, 31 for residential and 37 for commercial use. And submitted plans provide 140 class one bike parking spaces and 118 cl class two bike parking spaces, far exceeding the minimum number of bike parking spaces required uh, per the city's municipal code. And a library loading space is additionally provided over here. Um, due to the site's location with the, the city's downtown parking district, uh, the parking requirement is determined pursuant to resolution NS 29 858, which establishes a parking ratio of one parking space for every 400 square feet of gross floor area for all new commercial uses, except for medical and dental offices. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, 243 total parking stalls are provided um, for the project and uh, address helping to address the deficit of 448 stalls which would, uh, regardless of the provision of 243 stalls here, continue re to remain for the uh, downtown parking district due to the uh, pending and uh, foreseeable projects associated with downtown development. Um, related to state density uh, bonus law, um, state density bonus law exempts the residential component of the project from provision of parking due to its level of affordability and location within half a mile of a major transit stop. Uh, the project, as I mentioned earlier, would provide 243 total parking spall, stalls, uh, attempting to address the ongoing deficit of downtown parking, um, which would remain at 448 stalls. Um, to address the um, state's need for affordable housing, the state of California, as a background, adopted its state density bonus law in 1979 to encourage the provision of subsidized dwelling units by offering to, to developers a combination of benefits and incentives. A state density bonus law allows for any residential project located within a half mile of a major transit stop to request exemptions from maximum density controls. A qualifying project may receive waivers um, for variation from standards, which would have the effect of otherwise physically precluding development of the number of units as allowable per density bonus law and allows for four incentives or concessions and is not required to include vehicular parking for residential units. For this project, the, the base density plans incorporate two stories of underground parking uh, positioned below the portion of the building, including the library, commercial tenant space, uh, childcare facility, and residential units. However, due to the elevated costs associated with two stories of subterranean construction of parking, um, the underground parking uh, concept is not a feasible option for the project. When the parking is placed at surface level, 
uh, as allowable per density bonus law as requested in Senate of concession. Uh, the parking structure's height of approximately 33 feet would remain less than 35 feet as identified in the downtown plan for parking garages. However, the overall building height, including the 100% of affordable housing units, would exceed the 50-foot maximum height identified in the downtown plan, again, um, therefore requiring the request for a variation to the building height as an incentive concession. Uh, the easterly component of the project um, incorporates residential units above the public parking, Placement of parking above grade is requested due to identifiable and actual cost reductions of the project elevates the height of the residential portion of the project to 84 feet again beyond the maximum height threshold of 50 feet identified in the city's downtown plan. The applicant has, again has requested approval of a density bonus waiver to allow for the additional height in addition to the incentive concession for proposed placement of the parking garage at grade. Due to the project's affordability levels and location within a half mile of a major transit stop, the project remains exempt from maximum density controls. With 124 residential units proposed, the project exhibits an FAR of 4.60 under the maximum FAR threshold of 5.0 allowable by the general plan um, and the designation of RVC on land within the city's downtown plan area. Without the requested waiver, the proposed development would be physically precluded from redevelopment, excuse me, redevelopment of the number of residential units allowable for consistency with state law and the city's general plan in which residential um, density is indirectly regulated by FAR. Um, as mentioned, the pro, um, project provides a 100% affordable housing uh, residential a component of 124 units exclusive of the manager's units consistent with the city regulations which require a minimum 20 percent affordable housing uh, rate for the project a geotechnical evaluation uh, dated june 2nd of 2022 was prepared by cornerstone earth group and it indicates that the construction of the proposed project supported by shallow foundations overlining uh, ground imp improvement to mitigate the potential for liquefaction remains feasible from a geotechnical standpoint and provides that the final project design addresses the concerns that have been raised in that report. Uh, the geotechnical investigation um, provides was provided to the building division, uh, which has expressed no concern related to the analysis. In addition, a cultural resources or archaeological evaluation was conducted. Uh, results of on-site archaeological surveys, including ground and sur subsurface assessments, identified no cultural resources at the subject site, which would render the project site or its contents of significance requiring protection under the California Environmental Quality Act. The standard conditions of approval protect archaeological resources on the site. Um, additionally, a transportation impact study or TIS, a trip generation analysis, uh, was prepared and provides an assessment of the potential impacts of the uh, proposed project to traffic and circulation um, of the project and its neighboring area. Um, that transportation impact study um, demonstrates the occurrence of anticipated impacts of the project inherent to any new development, but uh, the project would generate additional vehicular trips to the project site surrounding neighborhood. However, uh, noticeable impacts of the city's transportation system associated with those additional vehicular trips would remain low despite the scale of the project. And aside from minor impacts related to level of service, which no longer serves as a legally defensible metric for measurement of environmental impact related to transportation, no other significant uh, transportation related effects resulting from the proposed project were identified uh, through the trip generation study and its associated impact study. Um, additionally, a noise impact uh, study or an acoustic analysis was prepared by consultant Salter Incorporated and evaluated the project's potential for generation of unwanted sound and the likelihood for compliance of the project with standards of the city's general plan and municipal code. And conditions of approval have been incorporated in the project for compliance with noise study standards. Additionally, a historic evaluation um, was prepared dated March 14th of 2022 by city approved historian Seth Bergstein of past consultants LLC. And that uh, study showed that the existing building on site um, appears ineligible for listing on any registers, including the California Register for Historic Resources or the National Register or the City of Santa Cruz Historic Building Survey. Finally, uh, several environmental site ass assessments were prepared by consultant Weber Hayes and Associates, including um, existing soil contamination testing. Uh, the project 
uh, site was um, uh, found to have existing soil contamination. However, it will be required to comply with all requirements of the County Environmental Health and Safety Department related to voluntary cleanup and conditions of approval have been added to this effect. In analyzing any proposed project, uh, the city may consider whether existing environmental documents contain an adequate analysis of potential environmental impacts associated with the proposed project. An earlier analysis may be used when it can be demonstrated that one or more effects have been adequately analyzed in an earlier EIR or negative declaration per state CEQA guidelines. If a previous analysis is used, an evaluation of the, of the potential impacts of the proposed project may uh, be conducted through preparation of an initial study checklist. An environmental checklist for determination of CEQA exemption has been prepared by uh, the city's consultant, DUDEC, for the project in accordance with the procedures directed um, through the California Environmental <laughs> Quality Act. The memorandum states that the city's, um, which an additional memorandum was just prepared, states that the city's general plan 2030 environmental impact report has addressed adequately the potential impacts associated with the project for all required categories of impacts and the project therefore necessitates no further environmental review pursuant to public resources code uh, section 21083.3 for likely uh, consequences associated with the project associated with environmental impact. Um, through the evaluation, site-specific impacts have been analyzed and determined to be less than significant due to substantial mitigation from general plan policies, zoning regulations, and or development standards that are uniformly applied to development projects throughout the city for all categories of impacts. Therefore, pursuant to public resources code section 21083.3 and state CEQA guidelines, no further environmental analysis is required under CEQA. And as detailed in the prepared evaluation, the project qualifies for the statutory exemption found in CEQA uh, guidelines section 21083.3 and a notice of exemption has therefore been prepared. As mentioned, several entitlements have been requested for the project as listed on this slide. Uh, the proposed project requires approval of a non-residential demolition authorization permit, a use permit, a design permit, and a lot line adjustment. Staff have made findings to support the proposed project. Uh, please note the suggested additions to the recommended conditions of approval have been made, and I can present those um, a little bit later after the presentation. Uh, staff recommends that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination. Staff additionally recommends that the commission uh, recommend to the city council approval of a non-residential demolition authorization permit, use permit, design permit, and lot line adjustment based upon the findings included and the conditions of approval attached to the staff report. And as uh, with additions as noted, and I'll actually briefly um, share the additional conditions of approval. Okay, so um, this uh, hopefully visible here is a Word document. Um, there are some suggested uh, conditions of approval that were added um, uh, recently to the project. And um, uh, so this is um, basically the idea being that uh, to ensure consistency of the project as submitted for building permit, uh, it was suggested that a uh, condition of approval will be added um, allowing for uh, staff to have the ability to coordinate with a, um, a subcommittee of the Planning Commission that would um, uh, confer to review any sort of design changes um, and ensure um, that those design changes were acceptable to the Planning Commission. And um, this, uh, again, is, is a bit tough to, to read probably, but that's essentially what this uh, bottom condition shows. Um, additionally, um, the uh, uh, other conditions of approval uh, were added to the project. And um, let me see if I can go ahead and scroll through here. Um, one of those conditions was uh, a proposed uh, addition of, of electric vehicle parking spaces to account for a total of 25 
uh, total parking spaces and allow for the other parking spaces um, in the project to be uh, prepared for electric vehicle ready stalls. And um, I, uh, I think um, Commissioner Kennedy, I, I don't know if the procedures allow yeah. for it. Would you like to add on to that at all? Uh, not at all. I can explain these in more detail in a little bit to the other commissioners. I appreciate you going through them the first time. And then I wonder if you can just email this to everybody or test can, you know, just so they can read it on their own screens now that we're in session. Oh, yeah. Tim, if you email it to me, I can do my thing and post it online so that the public can see it. Okay. Uh, thanks for your patience, everybody. We were editing in a draft until about 5.30 tonight, so... I just want to make sure the, the right one gets out to everybody, including the public. Okay. So I'm, I'm sorry. I'll just kind of uh, um, retract slightly, I guess. Um, uh, so we'll actually share a cleaner version of those. And um, I, uh, um, Commissioner Kennedy, if you wanted to propose those conditions of approval so they're um, yeah. originating could, from the right party. Could I have a point of order? Because those are, has a motion been made for those? conditions no because we haven't got to that part of the meeting yet so right right yeah so, so it seems like we, would, we would present those when we got to that part of the meeting is that correct after we hear from the public yeah that's a good point cindy let's finish the applicant presentation and then i can roll those out okay apologies for any confusion there i just wanted to um uh clarify that the conditions of approval recommended by staff were uh suggested to be modified to include additional conditions. Um, so uh, going back to um, this slide here, let's jump through it quickly and hopefully, okay. So hopefully that slide is visible. Um, so as I mentioned earlier- um, Tim, I don't see it yet. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. Is the slide visible? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, staff have made the findings to support the proposed project. And um, as I mentioned as well, some uh, additional conditions of approval have been raised as possible um, items of consideration. Uh, staff recommends that the planning commission acknowledge the environmental determination and staff additionally recommends that the commission recommend to the city council approval of the non-residential demolition authorization permit uh, use permit, design permit, and lot line adjustment um, based on the findings included and conditions of approval attached to the staff report with the corrections and additions as will be later uh, presented. And in terms of uh, next steps, a city council hearing is tentatively uh, scheduled for March the 14th of 2023, at which time the city council may render a final decision regarding the project entitlements. And uh, staff of the, uh, and the applicant are available to answer questions. Thank you very much for your time. And this concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Uh, great, Tim, thank you. Do commissioners have questions now? I would suggest we go ahead with the applicant and ask questions after, but if anything is burning, let me know. Cindy, you're good, I see your hand up. All right, let's hear from the applicant then. Mm -hmm. Tim, which, which applicant it? is doing the presentation? Do you need to, do I need to unmute somebody or is it on the panelists? Hi, uh, um, Samantha. Thanks, uh, Chair Kennedy. Um, I believe that that was the the applicant's presentation we were we were presenting on on behalf of the city. Oh, good. So there's um, no additional um, right. presentation. And, okay. And, 
Brian Borguno is um, the representative for the, the project. So if you wanted to add anything, that would be the time, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Sam. I just wanted to, to chime in and, and let the commissioners know that we do have the full project team available. But in this case, you know, we have a development partner um, and the city is also acting as an, a, a co-applicant in some ways for this project because it's a city sponsored project. Um, so that is the only presentation we had prepared was was through Sims presentation. Um, but we have the full team here to assist and answer any questions or provide any additional information uh, to all of the commissioners at this time. Great, thank you, Brian. Good, so we'll turn back to the commissioners for questions. Uh, I don't wanna keep everyone for a long time, but um, I was thinking today how important this project is for our downtown. I was here in 1989 when the earthquake hit, and I remember like as a 13 year old standing on that street and being like, oh my gosh. So I wanna encourage all of you commissioners to ask all your questions, get it all out. The reason we're up here even at this late date is to help this project with our local advice. So um, let's take our time and all suggestions welcome. Anybody wanna start with questions? Uh, Cindy? Yeah, thank you to staff for that really thorough um, presentation and, and thank you to um, getting all the materials up and um, allowing us to go through a, a big stack of stuff been a long time coming. Um, I, I have just a set of questions. I'm going to try to run through them really quick. And and this is an effort just to have full transparency, to have all the information out in front of the public so we have realistic expectations as we're going forward with this project. Um, so I, I apologize if I missed it. I'm not sure who this is for, but what is the level of affordability of the 124 units? It are what income level um, is it a mix or is it a single income level of affordability for those units? I, I can start with the answer to that question. It's a mix. Um, there's a, a table that's been prepared uh, that could be, I guess, probably presented. I think that's um, a uh, uh, the numbers have been basically solidified. Um, Brian, feel free to, to chime in if uh, there's been any revision to what was uh, sent um, earlier. No, I don't believe there's been any revision. And to give uh, a more direct answer to Commissioner Dawson, um, right now we're, we're targeting for extremely low income, 19 units, very low income, 59 units, and low income, 45 units. And those are all based on um, HC, HCD terminology definitions of affordability. Thank you so much for that clarification. That's really helpful. Just for the public, is that table in the staff report and I somehow missed it? And if it is, can we get a page number just for folks or is it not in the staff report? I will find where it's cited. I believe it's cited in the CEQA documentation at some point. I will find that okay. page number and try to get that um, made available as quickly as possible. Okay, that, that, that's great. Thank you. Um, that's very helpful. Um, I'll keep it going here. I don't want to take up too much time. Um, so, the city currently does not own 113 Lincoln. Um, there's a part in the staff report on page nine that talks about we're in active negotiations. I find it a little odd that we would be issuing a demolition permit for a building that we don't own on a piece of property we don't own. So um, I was just wondering if staff could talk about the, the process for that and if, if we are have all our legal basis covers to um, issue a demolition pit, uh, permit for a building we don't own. Brian, would you like to address that question? Yeah, I think I, I can, I'd be happy to. Thank you for that question again, Commissioner. Essentially, we have uh, an authorization, owner's authorization form signed by the current property okay. owner that, that authorizes Jim Rendler and for the future housing to secure all entitlements associated with the project at this point. Great, that's very helpful. Just wanted to make sure all our um, T's were crossed and I's were dotted. Okay, so uh, one more. Uh, so on the child care facility and the, um, it's got very little outdoor space, right? So it's got 674 square foot um, of outdoor space um, it, and the staff report says 70 square foot is required. So as we've talked 
to the regulating authority and we're going to be asking for a reduction in the amount of outdoor space per child. Um, the current space the standard would be about nine kids um, and we want to half the amount of space per child um, so we can fit 17 kids in this facility. Is there any opportunity to bump um, back into the the library garbage area and potentially lose some parking so we can get more outdoor space for kids in this child care facility? Is that something that is, is, is we can explore at this point or, or are we past that point? Brian, would you like to address that question? Yeah, I think uh, for that one, I'd, I'd probably like to bring in Jim Renmutter um, from For the Future Housing and, and maybe allow him as a developer and then maybe call upon his design team to answer it because it's more of a, a design-specific question about accommodating additional space. Um, mm -hmm. So if Jim could be brought in to uh, start up, off that conversation, that would be great. Uh, hello, Commissioners. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, mm -hmm. great. Um, Jim Renmutter, I'm Vice President for the Future Housing. Uh, thank you all for um, your commitment on the commission and um, appreciate the, the question. Uh, I think I'll let our design team speak a little more to it, but I, I think the short answer is we're absolutely open. We understand the need, um, but we have some limitations with, you know, trying to design the project and, and make that actually functional outdoor space while also creating an active corner for that you know commercial space so we have some competing goals we tried to create as large of a child care center as we can and unfortunately um, there are some limitations I I don't think it's as simple as being able to to do what was suggested um, but we're definitely you know open to exploring and I think the challenge is just we have done a lot of that and um, Frank if if you could potentially uh, speak I don't know if Frank um, it's able to unmute as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it certainly would require losing probably six, maybe five or six parking spaces if it, I'm just eyeballing the plan to, to basically provide the library with a garbage and support area and be able to move the daycare center back to the east, I guess, towards the garage. Um, I don't want to hold up the whole thing. I just want to throw it out there as a possibility and maybe we can discuss more. I want to give the public their time, but, um, can you hear I, me? I, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Frank, we can hear you. Hi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Frank Saxter, project architect. Um, so yeah, we, as Jim uh, alluded, we, we've looked at that quite a bit. Um, some of the parameters that, yeah, we're dealing with, as you noted, is the, the library service corridor, which access is off of, um, Cathcart. Um, and, and keeping the commercial corner large enough to really keep viable tenant space is really our biggest concern and, um, and not really feeling that the daycare can occupy that corner, quite the presence that we would want in terms of transparency on a busy corner like that, uh, and transparency or with daycare as being intentionally a little bit more inwardly focused and then obviously the security needs for the outdoor play area. Um, the other kind of challenge that we run up against is, uh, as you can imagine, we have quite a bit of structural and, uh, and fire separation related between parking and all the commercial uses in the library and, uh, and trying to keep uh, a simplicity of structure for cost effectiveness, um, but also um, just how parking garages lay out um, in a very simple grid pattern. And so, um, as Jim alluded to, we definitely can look at if there's ways to increase some of that play area, but we just have a really a limited of frontage to work with without cutting into um, kind of library support and uh, office space. Really, as you see the, the egress stair there on the plan kind of to the left of the play area and such. So, um, but yeah, I, I think as we, as we jump back into the design and start refining it into our next phase of design development, um, we definitely will be looking at that and how to maximize that. Okay, great. Um, last one, um, and we can move along. Um, so uh, I have some experience uh, kind of remediating uh, to toxic um, 
work areas. I, I worked for state parks and was um, the environmental scientist on site for a big uh, revamp of a Silomar down in Monterey. And that site has been in use since 1913. So there, there was uh, different issues with buildings and the soils and et cetera. And so I'm just wondering if somebody could speak to kind of any additional costs um, that we think are going to be um, added to the project that aren't we're, we're already planned for um, with um, the toxic soil that we've already know about, and also are 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 there are we planning for potential remediation for the demolition of um, the total fit one thirteen building um, since that's an eighty year old building and it's likely there's going to be some associated with that. I'm just curious about how it may affect the timeline. Um, just so we kind of have realistic expectations and the budget as well, and, and whether all that's kind of figured in or is that something we're going to have to fund. Yeah, uh, Jim Remler, I can speak to that. You know, it's this is fairly typical with what mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing. Um, you know, we're under construction with the Pacific Station South project currently, and um, we pretty much just factor in in any area that has sensitivities that you're pretty much doing a vapor barrier system these days. It's, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's generally um, going to be, you know, associated remediation on any structures that are demolished that are, you know, pre-78, and that's also factored in. So I, we're pretty up to speed, and we've worked with this consultant extensively on, you know, multiple projects in um, Santa Cruz, and we have a fairly good um, handle on, on what those anticipated costs are, and they're built in. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody answering my questions, and I'll uh, kick it back to um, the chair. Thanks, Cindy. Those are good questions. Uh, anyone else want to ask some questions? Uh, Tim Marie. Hi, thank you, um, Tim Marie, and um, I've got a few questions here um, related mostly architecturally. Um, <laughs> um, I have, I'm curious if the design team can talk about um, the strategy for mitigating the sun and solar gain and glare on the west facade, just to explain a little bit about um, how they worked through that and and, and educate us a little bit on there on, on that. Um, I can start and then uh, I believe Abe, the uh, library architect is also on the call and I'll have him chime in. Um, the general strategy with all of the west facing library facade glass is a, is a glass type called fritted glass, which basically greatly reduces the, uh, the solar heat gain coefficient through that glass. Um, there's different levels of fritting, and uh, again, I'll let Abe kind of dig into more detail if you'd like. But um, basically, the, of what Tim alluded to in the presentation is the density of the fritting allows for increased transparency, especially down closer to the street, and uh, to allow uh, visibility and such. And then as we get higher up, uh, it's denser. And, uh, and so that's the primary way. Um, there'll also be solar control within or on the other side of the glass to prevent glare and, uh, and direct gain. But as you all are probably aware, the heat needs to be stopped before it passes through the glass and such. Um, so th that's the primary treatment on that. For the residential, um, the, uh, the window size, as you saw, are, are punched openings. We do have the the uh, we will have I guess direct gain in, in the residential windows because those those will be clearer, but they are of a smaller size, and uh, and many of them have a small amount of operability and or the ventilation within the units to to deal with any heat that's gained through that. But um, so that's that's the kind of the 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 big overview. Um, let's see if Abe wants to chime in at all with any additional information on the library where we have the most west facing glass. Yeah, thank you, Frank, and thank you, commissioners. Um, you know, Frank hit a couple key points in regards to um, kind of the solar exposure. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, it, this is a library, so we do want to design an open and transparent building. Um, it's important that there's a visual connection, um, you know, between the street and the building. It's a public building in nature, and, you know, transparency is kind of philosophically important as well as, uh, you know, just sort of technically important. 
the um, the other kind of element of a, a project like this is we only have a couple facades to work with to bring daylight in. And in this case, the, one of the longest facade of the property is the west facade. So it is important that we incorporate um, glazing on that facade for daylight. This is a, um, a lead building and then it's a, also we're aiming to be a zero net energy building um, if we can uh, sort of budget for the photovoltaic panels. So it has to be really energy efficient. A big part of energy efficiency is reducing um, use uh, from lighting, um, and not uh, uh, artificial lighting. So we get that through uh, this glazing in the building. The other element that's important is uh, the way the glazing is tiered allows for natural ventilation. We have kind of a stack effect in the building and we're actually gonna have a, um, automated windows that um, are connected to a temperature sensor outside. And when there's it's a temperate day, which you have often in Santa Cruz, there's gonna be windows that automatically open along the base of the second floor. And then windows that also automatically open along the top of the Clara story allowing hot air to kind of move through, ventilate the building and escape out the top. And it's actually going to significantly reduce, uh, you know, HVAC requirement, zero net energy goals. Um, and then, you know, as, as Greg noted, we have a FRIT pattern. Um, so in addition to high performance glass, we have FRIT um, that gonna, is going to cut down on both heat gain and glare. And then there is going to be a time of day when that sun is low and at, at an acute angle and we'll drop the shades, which will be automated as well at that time. Great, thank you. Appreciate that thoughtfulness. Um, okay, so then my next question um, has to do mostly with the commercial space um, or spaces. Um, I understand that the programming is currently, you know, the goal is to have total fitness Take that space and it's currently designed as a three-story commercial space um, but I, I also read and know that the programming is um, supposed to stand the test of time because that's what we as architects and designers would like to do and so i um, curious about the um, this sort of I guess the single use occupancy as it's designed now versus down the road if there needed to be multi tenants in that space. And if you could explain a little bit um, about how you see that um, trend, you know, like changing over time from a design perspective. Jim or Brian, do you want to start or would you like me to? Uh, Frank, I think you can go into how we're looking at that space being flexi flexible in a lot of ways uh, for a variety of tenants, and I think it would be appropriate for you to speak to that. Okay. Yeah, so the submitted design, which, um, as Tim alluded to, we prepared towards the end of last year, definitely shows a, a more of a single-use commercial vertically connected space, um, but we have um, met with and spoke with potential tenants such as Total and and and, and looked at how we could break that space up if need be in the future or if uh, that tenant wanted less space. And so some of those ideas include um, rotating the stair and elevator to allow for um, basically a, a commercial vertical lobby or, or access on, on different levels so that if the ground floor was, for instance, a corner coffee shop and didn't need access to those stairs and elevators that the tenants above would have access. And, uh, and that would also allow technically for the second and third floor to be um, separated tenants as well. Um, so, um, uh, and then, yeah, we also have looked in that we can, from an egress standpoint, have a second means of egress uh, that is separated by floor or, or allows for uh, uh, egress from each of the floors down. So it has been a consideration, especially because of the uh, kind of visibility of that corner space and, and um, what type of tenant would basically benefit from that most and giving the city as, uh, as kind of the landlord of that type of redeveloped space or, or trying to fill those spaces with a, the, the best and optimal use. Um, so it has been considered, so. Yeah. Oh, okay. so I was just gonna add to that, the, the um... You know, we, we understand how important it is. It's been very clear that really maintaining, you know, um, the 
two story height and really trying not to change that elevation. I think it, it, it has been intentionally um, flexible in the design to um, accommodate. And I think it's very likely that it could be a standalone tenant in that corner space. Right. Um, I think I just would, um, you know, I think it would be on the uh, benefit the city to have a really clear roadmap on how that modification would happen easily if it were to be the case. Um, and with that, um, in in looking at um, these the, the the drawings as it currently stands, um, I don't see specific um, mechanical exhaust venting or grease trap mentioned in there. And so I know the other commissioners are like, wow, second meeting, and she sounds like a broken record. But <laughs> um, but you know, in the in you know, in the goal of having this be a long-term flexible space, um, I would like to recommend that <laughs> the proper chase and, and venting and um, grease trap be identified so that it can have a copy shop, as you mentioned, even though right now it might be a total fitness. Um, so, um, that's that part. Um, I, I don't know if you have in, anything to say about that. Um, yeah, I, I can, I mean, we are committed to, you know, this is really a partnership with the city and, and we absolutely want to, um, that those items that you mentioned are items that while it might not be on the, at this stage, cause we're not really into the design development. Um, they are things that would pretty much be standard that we would be thinking about as a course of pre-planning to get, a, allow the city the widest range of flexibility for that space. Yeah. So is there a great That's great. Yeah. Answer? And um, I, I, I'd like to assume that that was the case, but it, unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes we, we come across a lot of projects where that isn't, where that isn't the case. And so I'd just like to, to mention it. So thanks. Um, and then lastly, um, I would like to just, um, just bring up the alley as a, um, a potential opportunity um, and um, concern. I know that, um, you know, the alleys are, are really important and, and they serve a great purpose. They can also be a nuisance. And, um, um, and so I guess I would just like to, um, I guess, have us consider that 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 there's an opportunity to activate that space um, from a pedestrian and and um, bike um, access um, and I know planning had mentioned that 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 was being considered. I just really w would like to make sure that it can be a focus um, because um, I think there's an opportunity there to activate that space for good and and mitigate potentially any um, unwanted things if we don't address it um, as part of the whole, um, you know, human scale um, factor that this, that, that is being considered on the street fronts. So um, I believe that's all <laughs> for me. Uh, thanks, Commissioner Gordon. Brian, I see your hand is up. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Kennedy. I just wanted to, uh, one, for the affordability levels in the large packet that we have on page 208, there's a description of the affordable levels that I just described a moment ago. Um, and then second, speak to uh, Commissioner Gordon's concerns about the alley activation. Um, I think Nathan Wynn could also speak to that alleyway a little bit further, but I think this alley is gonna be a little bit unique in the sense that there's some primary business access there already, um, that that is their main point of ingress and egress. So there is going to be heavier pedestrian traffic than typical alleyways. Um, and then with that in mind, we are also thinking in terms of like, how can we uh, ensure lighting, security, those types of features are, are predominant. Um, and then on a general level, economic development is looking at, you know, alley activation programs for all of downtown um, across all the alleyways. So I don't, I don't think this one's going to pose any unique concerns. And if anything might lend itself to a more pedestrian friendly um, access corridor to begin with. And uh, I think Nathan wanted to add to, to that, I think I'd be happy to hear from him as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Nathan, one director of public works. And 
Um, appreciate the comment there, Commissioner Gordon. We definitely want to keep um, access for for bike and pedestrian access, as well as vehicle access in the downtown core. So we definitely are planning on maintaining that. Um, and then as we go towards um, uh, building plans, that we'll definitely be looking at it more closely. As Brian mentioned, lighting or maybe some other striping. You know, there's some treatments that we can tell uh, do to enhance that area. But it is a main entrance to one of the buildings, and there is servicing that needs to happen with regards to. A, a garbage collections and fire access, et cetera. So um, we definitely want to um, make it a space, an open inviting space as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. I had some concerns as well about the, there's a stormwater planter in the alley now, and it just looked like that'll be worked out later in design, but it's a really valid concern. Um, good, any other questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Kennedy, just to speak briefly to the stormwater, uh, yeah, we'll definitely be working that out as the design progress. Uh, the big challenge, as you can imagine, is we're surrounded obviously on all sides, and so to get roof drainage to go to a completely different frontage, so we'll have to figure out something creative that uh, allows us to to deal with a large quantity of waters on that on that uh, east elevation. But yeah, so. But just wanted to speak to that since I, I know you're concerned about it. But yeah, we definitely are looking at every space we can find to deal with stormwater with the, the tight site. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. I understand that the state regulations are really rough in that area and that alternatives are really expensive. So um, this is a good example of just bringing something to your attention. We don't need a condition of approval, but I hope it's valuable to give that input. Um, Commissioner Conway. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll have some more comments, but um, my question at this point is um, regarding, regarding bike parking and types of bike parking. Um, there's some been some discussion about whether or not there's um, bike parking for, that are larger for some of the um, you know alternative uh, shaped bikes, um, and I'm wondering if there's a way to um, incorporate those in, or if you've anticipated that. Um, and then also some of the locations of bike parking. I thought there were some good points made about where it really belongs and to make sure that it's located in places that really make it very easy and in fact, much easier to ride bike than to get there any other way. Thank you. Uh, Brian or Claire? Thank you, Commissioner Kennedy. I'll kick it off and then I'll probably hand it over to Claire Galogli, our transportation planner. But I just want to say from the onset, like our goal is ambitious on the bike parking. And I think like we still have refinement to tweak the, the variety of uses that we want to accommodate. Um, and one thing that was provided to us more recently in the last few months is there, there is now a, a spec sheet on the bike locker that um, our current provider downtown provides a cargo bike locker that they didn't previously provide. And so we're going to look to incorporate that into the system um, as well as bike share. You know, when that comes back online this summer, that, that's another feature that I think we want to make sure is, is very present at this location. And I'll let uh, Claire kind of take it from there. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, Claire Gluggly, Transportation Planner with the city. Um, Commissioner Conway, I, I think you might be referring to the comments in the letter from Rick Hyman. And I think there was a lot of good that was included there. Some of the things that I appreciate about the design are that all three frontages now include class two bike parking. So anyone that's traveling to the daycare, anyone that's traveling to the residential entrance or any of the businesses that front either Lincoln or Cedar or Cathcart there have options for that quick walk up bike parking. I think that's a major improvement over some preliminary designs. And those um, class two bike parking spaces do accommodate a wide variety of sizes and styles of bikes, which is very nice. Uh, the bike room, the class one bike parking that's designed for residents has some opportunities to be able to further expand for alternatively sized bikes. That's not currently part of our requirements in our code. It's something that we're working towards and you'll actually see that on the 14th at your planning commission meeting, um, 14th of March. But um, as Brian said, we are also working towards with our bike locker vendor bike link. They have just released a cargo size bike blocker and we have a hundred thousand dollars line items in next year's budget in order to install more of those in the downtown and this is one of the locations we'd be looking at 
um, the delay, there's a supply chain on delay on those. So we did just update some of our downtown bike lockers, but those we wouldn't have been able to get until around May. So we went ahead with regular lockers. So um, all that is to say, I think the mix of bike parking that's included in this project is very appropriate. I think there's opportunities to further improve bike parking downtown as a whole. Um, but I, I think that it's very, very appropriate for this size and scale of the project. And then Claire, while you're there, I think the nearest bike share is in front of Del Mar. Am I remembering that right? The nearest currently permitted right there. Bike share is right at the Del Mar. Um, as part, we also plug, if you go to city of Santa Cruz .com slash bike share, we are accepting recommendations for additional bike share locations. We are planning to permit about 150 additional docks within the city. Uh, there's also a map on that website of existing permitted bike share stations. And any bike share questions, feel free to ask. We're really excited and we are launching in June. Um, great, the more the merrier in my opinion on that front. Um, thanks for your questions, Julie. Um, anyone else wanna chime in? All right, everybody's looking happy. I've asked uh, about a million questions of staff by email, so I only have one left. Um, so I get it that the re you can't require automobile parking for the residents and that they would be in the downtown parking district. So would they have to pay market rate to park in a garage that's touching their own building? Uh, this is Claire Glogley again. I'm happy to take that one. Um, yes, this parking would be unbundled from the unit. So any parking that a resident wanted to consume, they would need to purchase that parking either by paying the daily rate, the hourly rate, or obtaining a monthly parking permit. We are anticipating that there will be uh, monthly permits available in this structure. We're modeling that as part of our financial model as uh, part of when it comes online. So that would be an option, but yes. Um, anyone that uses this public supply of parking would need to pay for, for the use of that space. Are there reduced rates for affordability levels or is it just Currently, no, it's something that we are exploring for fiscal year 25, 26 and beyond. The technology that we have for our parking access and revenue control system right now doesn't allow us to do that, but it is something that we are um, considering how we could roll out in the future. Thank you. Uh, that's I have mixed feelings about that. That's wonderful to have unbundled parking, but I'm just worried about where uh, people are going to park in this middle time while we still have cars um, getting into comments. So, Sean, I see your hand. Oh, you can. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, I also have shared the same concern, uh, Chair Kennedy, and I was wondering. I know in the past. Um, thanks again, everybody, for the presentation. It's a beautiful building. Looking forward to it. Um, I was wondering, we've talked about it in the past. I know when we did the South of Laurel uh, plan, we've talked about um, offering bus passes to residents um, as a possible offsetting because we're not going to be offering, they don't have bundled parking. I'm wondering if we've thought about it or if that's a possibility of, of offering uh, bus passes. Uh, to residents as a possible offset for the lack of parking options, um, just as affordable as an affordability uh, aspect. I'll take that one again, Claire Globally. Uh, we have two options. One, all people who are employed as part of this project are eligible to utilize our free transit passes for all downtown employees as part of our Go Santa Cruz program. Uh, not only do we provide transit passes, we also provide free bike locker cards. We will be rolling out discounts on bike share membership. We offer rebates or vouchers on e-bike purchases, monthly education and encouragement, free helmets, free lights, carpool incentives, and a whole host of other uh, transportation benefits. That's part one if you're an employee. Part two if you're a resident, um, the objective standards that we recently updated also updated chapter 10.46 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code which requires that residential buildings of 20 units or more enter into a contract with Santa Cruz Metro to provide unlimited local transit passes for all residents. So that is part of our part of our code that we have. Sweet. And that is, that is limited. This it applies to this project. It's also within half mile of major transit stops citywide. 
So short of literally paying people to ride their bikes, we're pretty much doing everything else. I like that. Oh, we pay people. Um, we give you dumb dollars. Oh, we also dollars do that. Okay. I got it. Yes, I'm we do that too. I'm out of date with my info. Okay. Um, <laughs> great. Um, Jim or Brian, whichever wants to go first. I see both your hands. Yeah. Oh, I'll let, I'll let Jim go first, and then I just wanted to kind of tie together some things that Claire pointed out. Um, I'll be brief. I just want to mention we're we're also uh, working on obtaining some funding that would allow us to help subsidize, you know, pay for the um, uh, transit passes for residents as well. So um, it's definitely on the the um, agenda to to really try to um, provide those residents with you know, free transit passes. Um, I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Jim. And then I just wanted to add that, you know, currently the way the parking program works for permits, it, it is exclusive to residents and employees downtown. So it's not, it's not like anyone can buy a permit for a, for a parking facility. Um, and I think that we'll continue to look at expansion of programs as more affordable housing comes online, especially with like the adjacent project across the street, um, which isn't providing parking on site for their residents. So I think that's going to be a continued conversation on how we manage uh, the pipeline projects and, and the new housing that's coming online um, in the parking district as a whole. Great, thank you for that. All right, any other commissioner questions or should we open the public hearing? Good, I don't see any other hands. I missed the 3D room because I can gauge how many people are here. Um, clerk, what do you think? We got maybe 30 people that are not staff online. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I would say probably 30, 35. The hands are starting to raise up now. And, um, this would be a good time to remind everyone that there's a delay, um, between if people Thank are watching you. on television, so we might want to give them a sec in between. Yeah. So I'll just sit back and, and give you a second between each thing to let the delay catch up. I see eight, nine, 10, and 10. I'm gonna limit public comment to two minutes. And before we begin to public comment, I wanted to remind everyone again that the tree issue will be held at the council meeting and we're here to just uh, look at the building tonight. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, please be as succinct as you can. And if someone has already said what you said, um, there's no real value in repeating it again. All that being said, thank you for coming. We welcome your comments and uh, let's get started with the first attendee. Okay, and I just wanted to remind the public that um, our timer function doesn't work really well with the way our um, system's set up. So you'll hear me say time when your two minutes is up. Uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is Kalisha Webster. And I'm the senior housing advocate at Housing Choices, a nonprofit service provider helping people with developmental and other disabilities to find and retain affordable housing throughout Santa Cruz County. I'm calling in support of the redevelopment of the sites at 113 and 119 Lincoln Street into a vibrant new mixed use development, including a library and affordable housing situated near transit and downtown, making it the perfect location for development of a walkable, bikeable, and more sustainable community. And by including deeply affordable housing, the project will be able to serve some of the city's most vulnerable and special needs populations. Eden Housing and For the Future Housing's proposal addresses a critical need for housing among the city of Santa Cruz's residents with developmental disabilities. The city is currently home to nearly 300 adults with developmental disabilities, only a third of whom have been able to transition to living independently with supportive services. Instead, most adults with developmental disabilities are living at home with aging parents due to the lack of deeply affordable housing available in the city. For this vulnerable population, many of whom are on fixed incomes from disability benefits or working part-time in low-wage jobs, remaining in the family home puts them at high risk of displacement or homelessness when parents are no longer able to provide the housing and support that they require. By collaborating with Housing Choices, who will provide on-site supportive services for the 11 households living in the homes set aside for people with developmental disabilities, the developer's proposal addresses the housing needs of an outright population by making them federal and by meeting federal and state priorities to provide inclusive housing opportunities to disabled members of the community and helps to meet the city's legal mandate to affirmatively further fair housing. 
We look forward to seeing the project move through the development process and hope to see the housing potential of the site maximized in order to create a more inclusive and sustainable Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. You're on the line. I'm sorry, I'm on the line? Yes, you are. Oh, thank you. Hey, my name's Ian McRae. I'm a owned who was Ivan Grill <coughs> at 221 Cathcart Street. Um, I want to shout out to my my mom, a retired librarian of the city of Santa Cruz there for 30 years. I have two questions. One is, um, is there a way to look up our potential for um, shadow on Cathcart Street and how that might affect um, our our businesses there, Lupolo <coughs> and, and and who is um, and my second question is is there any provisions made in terms of low-income housing for employees in the district I'm specifically thinking of <clears throat> some of my employees um, that might be um, their family you know families and have an opportunity to take advantage of um, low-income housing in the city of Santa Cruz namely really across the street from where they happen to work. And um, I think that's it, thank you. Uh, thanks for your comments. We'll gather up all the questions and then answer them at the end of the public comment. But uh, thanks for your questions. Hello, my name is uh, Dennis Hagen. I uh, am a retired librarian. Uh, I worked for over 30 years for the California State Library in Sacramento and was involved in a number of uh, new construction projects uh, for libraries as well as library renovations of historic buildings. This is an important countywide project. It's gone through a number of iterations with lots of public input. It's a, such a unique opportunity to provide both a community asset and housing in the core of Santa Cruz. And I urge you, urge you, urge you to uh, continue to support this project and help move it forward. Thank you. Hi. I wanted to, um, I'm a resident of Santa Cruz and I have a son with uh, developmental disabilities. I'm really excited about this project and uh, making Santa Cruz housing more inclusive. Um, I wanted to say that, I wanted to make sure that it's known that uh, people with developmental disabilities don't necessarily just need small studio. Um, sometimes they need um, to have caregivers that live with them um, sometimes they're married and they have families. Um, and so I just wanted to make, to, to ask after the public comment section, if someone could speak to the mix of uh, housing options that are gonna be available for people with developmental disabilities. And to say that I'm really excited about having a new library and more inclusive housing downtown because it's desperately needed for people with developmental disabilities with limited income. Thank you. Um, Fort Zoom host, you're on the line. Um, hi, this is Matt Farrell. I am speaking today for uh, Downtown Forward. Um, I'd like to thank all the folks that have worked so hard on bringing this project forward. I think uh, it's clear that uh, with the vote uh, last November, that where 59% of uh, the voters in that election rejected a proposal to not allow a library um, on this site, uh, it's clear what the will of uh, our residents is. 
And secondly, I would like to say that I would encourage the um, commission to approve this project and move it quickly to council because until this project has entitlements, uh, the affordable housing developers will not be able to move forward and seek grant funding. And those funds are competitive and the sooner we can get those, the more likely is our chance to move forward with this project. The same thing applies to the uh, downtown library project, part of this project. If they have entitlements, when they are competing for state library grants, they rank higher, high, higher because they are considered more shovel ready. So the rest of uh, the items and concerns uh, we had, we outlined in our letter to the Planning Commission. Thank you for your time and consideration. Um, hi, this is Linda Marin uh, from uh, Citizens Climate Lobby Santa Cruz and also the coalition Save Some Trees. And I appreciate what you said, Commissioner Kennedy, that we're not discussing trees tonight and, I've, and I'm glad we're not um, on the one hand, but I also can't help but say something about trees that are resonant with many of the things that have been said tonight. And first of all, I've learned a lot from the commissioners Question. So thank you all the commissioners who um, you know, provided good questions. Um, what I wanna say though about trees is um, as we are in this climate crisis and we are uh, needing to do everything we can to create um, environments that help to mitigate emissions, trees are absolutely essential. And this project um, cuts every single tree down on that lot. And there are two trees at least um, that the arborist has deemed you know, worthy of being saved that could be saved. So we are asking the city council to consider asking the architect to, um, who I think now is right there, Frank. Um, and I'm hoping that um, the architect is able to give the same kind of response that he gave to Commissioner Dawson with regard to the childcare um, space um, reconsideration. I, it sounds like it would be a big challenge and yet maybe something's possible. Um, I just want to uh, hope and, and urge all of you commissioners when it comes to uh, considering the trees um, in the next, I'm assuming the next meeting perhaps, um, or after the city council has heard the appeal, that, that you will also advocate for um, including trees in that design because um, we really need them. And I think it would be uh, really healing and good for the city to still be able to have some of those beautiful trees that we are all, um, that we identify with and I'm really need. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Isaiah Burke. I am a student at UC Santa Cruz, and I'm calling to urge the Planning Commission to expedite this project um, as quickly as possible. Um, as, as has been pointed out, uh, this uh, library project received the mandate of the voters, and it is absolutely essential that we uh, uh, create a dense, walkable, um, livable downtown core. Um, uh, I, as, I, the environmental impacts of um, cutting down a tree or two are negligible compared to the cost of sprawl and cutting down to the green belt. Um, and specifically with regards to uh, biking, um, I would be interested. First, I would. This is just a design thing. I dislike the wave racks. They they really don't, despite being aesthetically pleasing, they don't really provide um, 
as many uh, spaces for bikes as they pretend to. And also as an e-bike user, I'm interested in the possibility of outlets um, being uh, placed near bike racks so that people could charge their um, devices. But overall, um, I think that the Planning Commission should expedite this project as quickly as possible. And thank you. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you for your time and consideration. Any of us who has attempted to absorb the 1,600 plus pages of the agenda packet has gotten some sense of how complicated and consequential this project is. It's the most expensive and largest mixed use project ever considered by Santa Cruz. There are a number of serious concerns about a project of such size and expense, but for tonight, I'm only bringing up one of them. There's an intrinsic important contradiction in the staff's report. On the one hand, the staff report says this project would need both a waiver and a concession utilizing the state density bonus law in order to be permitted legally precisely because the plan is out of compliance with the downtown plan. How, uh, specifically, it's not in compliance with the downtown plan standards for the Cedar Street Village sub area. This sub area is composed of mostly one to two story buildings. It's meant to have a human scale and a village quality, and it allows a maximum of 50 foot height where this project is proposed to go. And this proposed project is at eight stories and goes to 84 feet height. At the same time, this staff report claims that this project qualifies for CEQA ex exemption. And for that qualification, the project has to be in compliance with the general plan and downtown plan. However, <laughs> that staff report demonstrates that the project is in fact substantially out of compliance. So since I think your task tonight is to review this project, in relation to our city's laws and any significant issues that there may be to be addressed, please recommend that either the project fails to qualify for a CEQA exemption and will in fact require a project EIR, or that the project will have to actually conform to the downtown plan to qualify for the CEQA exemption. Thanks so much. Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, we talk about the environment, and I believe that nothing can be worse than 10,000 cars going over 17 every day, back and forth. And uh, that's why I support this project. Hopefully, I work in construction, and uh, hopefully, I can attain a job there and be hired locally. And since it's a public works job, I would love to see more policing of the um, of the misclassification of workers because I, I, I was working in a job in Gilroy and it was a public works and we had laborers doing carpenter work, which in return, the ratio was five laborers to three carpenters when it should have been five to three, five carpenters to three laborers because of the misclassification of work. So I would love to see the policing of of um, the actual classification of the workers. I would love that. Um, this is taxpayer money. It should be policed and uh, used correctly. Um, and also um, hold the developers accountable for that. Because if, if we don't require that, we have, uh, I don't know, I want to say we need uh, more, just more policing. I would appreciate it. Uh, we need responsible contractors and developers to do public works jobs because it's tax money. And when things, the workers get misclassified, it's actually tax fraud. So please be alert of that. I don't know if you guys knew that or not, 
but I would appreciate it if you guys keep it in mind. Good night. Thanks. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, Brian Meckel on behalf of Santa Cruz EMB. Just wanted to call in in support of this project. We've been big fans of it. Uh, after the years of community input, it's transitioned into a project that now includes housing and a beautiful library. Uh, recently, we had the defeat of Measure O, showing the voters are in favor of this project moving forward and getting this affordable housing built. With over 12,000 people on the housing authority list, it's undeniable that we need more affordable housing in Santa Cruz, and this is a perfect project for it. It's in downtown, it's near the Metro Center. These are people who will not have to commute long distances to work anymore. Uh, they'll live in a very walkable area right next to transit with free transit passes, <laughs> which is fantastic. Uh, so we are completely in favor of you moving this project forward, getting it to city council so it can get entitlements and we can just keep moving it forward and get it built. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, planning commissioners. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Renee Baez, and I am a field representative for Carpenters Local for, uh, 505. And I'm here today to speak about three simple things which will benefit the great city of Santa Cruz. And I believe these three things should also be basic labor standards. One is the use of apprenticeship programs. Two is health care for workers and their families. And number three is local hire. You see, projects that invest in apprenticeships, health care, local hire are the best deal for construction workers and the community. This allows workers and their families to live in the communities that they work in. This also means those wages that are earned will be reinvested back into the local community as they spend their earnings. And to be upfront, the majority of the projects being built in the area do not have any labor requirements and be could be considered a crime scene just by how much these workers are being exploited and robbed of their wages and benefits. But projects like this have the ability to change lives for those who live right here in this community. So my question is this, being that this is a public work projects uh, with prevailing wage, will this project utilize apprenticeships? Will carpenters from local 505 here in this community have the chance to work on this project? Why wouldn't we have local hire, right? I believe uh, public work projects should have labor standards in place that generate opportunities for residents uh, in the area. But what is this city doing to prevent and protect these workers from being exploited by non-responsible developers and non-responsible contractors that they hire. I'd like you guys to please consider the need for labor standards when planning and developing the future in one of the most influential cities in the state of California. What are we doing? Thank you. Hi, this is. Oops, I'm going to mute my. Hi, this is Jorian Wilkins. I'm with the Downtown Association of Santa Cruz. We are. Um, we work with over 600 businesses in the downtown district, who overwhelmingly are in favor of this library. Our board of directors has unanimously voted uh, to support this library, and we are. Um, calling in today to urge you to do the same um, because we really want the vibrancy that this family attraction um, that this library would be um, to our community. It would make a huge difference to the vibrancy of our, our downtown and continue to um, be the kind of place we all want to come to. I don't know if anyone's been to the new libraries that have already been built all over the city, but they are real um, places that you can see people are using. They're like free offices. They are um, used every hour of the day and they have gorgeous views. And we would love to have a place like that downtown so downtown can continue to be as vibrant as the other areas of our community. Um, we also care a lot, the small businesses in downtown, about housing for our employees. And everyone knows that as a challenge and having more housing for uh, our employees downtown is, is a huge goal for, for our businesses as well. So thank you so much, all of you, um, each and every individual. I know it's a service to be a commissioner and we appreciate the time that each of you puts into this and um, hopefully we can all have a better community because of all of your work. Thank you.
Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, my name is Kersha Durham. I'm a local environmentalist. I've lived in Santa Cruz since 1981. So I sent a letter, and I'm just going to highlight some points. Cities, great cities, beautiful cities around the world are eliminating parking in their city centers. Some have eliminated park have eliminated parking as much as 70,000 spaces. Why? Well, Michael Kradonsky, he's a global research manager for the Institute of Development and Transportation. He says a huge reason to reduce parking is that nobody's drawn to a city because of great parking. We have to repair the damage that we've done by creating more parking and decimating our cities and highlighting parking. So I'm asking you to please reduce the parking and the commercial space of this building in order to keep heritage trees, the beauty, the green attractive areas that everyone is drawn to about Santa Cruz and keep it in our city center. Um, you've already seen that we have huge empty spaces in stores. COVID and the convenience of online shopping mean that people are not, so it's just ridiculous to add more commercial space when we can't fill what is there already. Save the area for green space, for nature, also, Jay Crawford, one of the leading voices in livable cities, he says, today's housing crisis stems from a lack of land. Once we get rid of cars and parking, the housing crisis will be solved immediately. So your own city staff report required half of the parking that you're proposing right now. So I think it's egregious to put in 243 spaces when they said, you can require to keep it, the regulation, at 122 spaces. Well, I'd like you to be courageous and create a commons that has even less parking than that in order to save lovely large trees and create more green space. We're talking about reducing the heat island that buildings like this create. We're also talking about the city debt. We're in a huge amount of debt, and if you reduce the parking and you reduce the commercial I'm space, the cost of this project is going to be reduced drastically. So I'm asking you, please, replace the parking with green spaces, with trees, with beauty. This is the reason why students from all over are drawn to them, why tourists come here. They don't want a cement block, a huge amount of parking. No one is drawn to cities. Great cities are not attractive right, next, because please. of their parking. Can you wrap up your thoughts? Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? My name is John Hall, and I appreciate the work of you commissioners. Uh, you have a, a, an immense job with this project because it's an immense uh, project. I want to associate myself with underscoring the importance of the question of whether there is compliance with the downtown plan and with uh, the Cedar Street corridor aspect of the downtown plan that would justify a CEQA exemption. Uh, by my reading of everything that is in the staff report, on the one hand, they say they're in compliance, and on the other hand, they say here's where we're out of compliance, and therefore we have the waivers that will cover uh, the kinds of issues that uh, we need to address by being out of compliance. Uh, that kind of contradiction cannot go forward uh, it, it, it seems to me that the duty of, of the um, Planning Commission is to examine uh, the entitlements uh, proposal for completeness and accuracy and conformity with law. And in that instance, uh, it, the, plan, the, the project plan is not conforming. Uh, the other issue that uh, I would point to, and this is, you know, I'm a textualist, uh, I get it that the tree issue is being appealed. Uh, and therefore is not part of what you're considering here, but you are considering making findings that relate to the trees, and uh, uh, it seems to me proper for you to exclude those findings that are relevant to heritage trees because they are indeed being uh, appealed. Uh, I, among other people who uh, supported Measure O, recognized that Measure O was defeated. Uh, on the other hand, uh, four out of 10 voters in Santa Cruz were willing to vote against a project 
uh, and, and for solving the problems of affordable housing in a different way. We think public space is important. We think trees are important. And uh, we hope that the project can be modified to accommodate more of the, uh, at least some of the heritage trees. But at any rate, it should not be in your findings anything uh, concerning conformity with uh, heritage trees uh, as part of your findings as the Planning Commission, in my view. Thanks very much for your time and your efforts. Good evening. My name is Elaine Johnson, Executive Director of Housing Santa Cruz County. Thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly this evening. Uh, I'm Sharon in support of Housing Santa Cruz County that we urge you to support the Downtown Library and Affordable Housing Project. As you know, Santa Cruz desperately needs affordable housing and is facing extreme pressure due to the lack of it. The proposed project is crit critical to the health and well-being of the community in so many ways. This project will continue the city's commitment to providing housing that is affordable to meet local needs. This is a well-designed project in a vibrant and, and accessible location. I urge the Planning Commission to support the advancement of this much needed project, the library, the, nurse, the nursery, the affordable housing, all of it. Thank you so very much. Bye-bye. Hi, uh, good evening, uh, commissioners. Uh, my name is Juan Garcia. I'm the program manager for Housing Choices. As you uh, know, my uh, colleague, uh, Kalisha, um, spoke of uh, a couple minutes ago. So uh, I'm calling, uh, I'm actually calling for the support of the development of the future housing for Eden Housing for the 124 apartments with the 11 uh, set aside units for uh, people with development disabilities. Uh, this site is ideally situated near the transit and downtown, making it a perfect location for development of walkable, bikeable, and more sustainable community. Uh, we strongly support the Planning Commission's recommendation that the space can be used for the affordable housing developer who can use the space to develop more affordable housing and deeper levels of affordable ability then uh, would, what would be achieved under the um, housing ordinance. This is especially important for need, uh, the housing needs of uh, Santa Cruz County special needs, with the, um, including with those with developmental disabilities who will require deeply affordable uh, rent pair with the coordinated support services funded by the San Andreas Regional Center. Uh, by having uh, affordable housing available for the special needs population, they will be provided with support service to live in the community. And having an on-site uh, resident coordinator is part of our, what we do in Housing Choices to check with them regularly to contact the circle support added an additional safety net for our clients. Um, we hope to see uh, the city commit in creating um, housing opportunities which increase housing accessibility for clients with development disabilities so that we can remain in the community where they could live and work. Thank you for your time. Thanks for your comments. I'll give it uh, just like an awkward pause to see if anyone else wants to raise their hand on the delay. If there's any more uh, comments from the public now's the time. Laura, I see your hand. Thank you. Um, I want to support what Kersha Durham was saying and what John Hall was saying. Um, there is less need for parking, and I totally support all your efforts um, in providing affordable housing. But I think there's some key issues that I'd like to speak to. Um, someone spoke about the guidelines for the Cedar Street corridor, which are being ignored. And those invested in this plan are selling it is what is best for Santa Cruz. 
The truth is renovation and preservation of already existing buildings are less costly to the city, which is currently running a large deficit. I also like to bring attention to the fact that most people have a library in, the, in their back pocket. So having an extensive large library is not as uh, relevant as just renovating what we already have. It is a beautiful thing, but it is, I think, an overstretch where people are not really interested in sitting around a mezzanine with a grand piano. I think more people come to Santa Cruz to see the birds and the beautiful um, trees and nature scape. I think there's some dangers in the project in that, in that there are some real needs for affordable housing and I'd like to see that being addressed more. There are also the exacerbation of the traffic congestion, put extra strain on our natural resources, especially our water supply. Even with the rain, the current infrastructure only captured about 5% of the rainfall. Now this is an oversight and I'd like to see preparedness be more uh, a prior priority for the city. We've experienced a lot of fires, storms, and earthquake, the trauma from the pandemic, all which we require Hi. us to recognize our limits, and we should build a community to scale with more visionary and forward-thinking ideas, less parking, yes, affordable housing, and more nature. Thank you. Thank you. I see one more call in, and I think this will be the last uh, comment. Are you there, caller? We can barely hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's a little better. Okay. Um, I would urge the, um, the council to um, um, re revisit your consultant study of Nelson and Nygaard from 2019 that found there is a surplus of parking in downtown Santa Cruz and that there is not a parking problem. And I don't know why you want to build more parking when you paid for a study, the city paid for a study to investigate this and found there was no problem with parking. So please believe, you know, the, the experts you hired to study this and um, reduce the parking. We do not need it. Um, if we're in such a housing crisis, um, don't put parking where you could build housing. So maybe just don't build a parking garage and encourage more congestion cars. If housing is really needed, and that's the point that everybody's pushing through, then build housing. Don't build housing for, for cars and garages. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All right, so I just said that would be the last comment, and now I have two more hands, so I'm going to change my mind. We'll have two more comments. Keep it quick, please, and then that will be the final answer, John. Hello? Yep, we can hear you. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, uh, members of the commission. My name is Juan Barbosa, and um, I am from uh, Carpenters Local 505 in Aptos. I represent the hardworking carpenters in Santa Cruz County. I am here tonight in support of the, of the downtown library project. Um, I believe uh, one of the gentlemen here tonight uh, speaking in favor, Renee Baez, already spoke about uh, 
things like local hire and, and apprenticeship program. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about that anymore. I just wanna say that I support the project and uh, our members would love to uh, work in their own backyard. Uh, you know, a lot of them are tired of uh, driving over the hill to Santa Clara County or farther. So uh, I urge you to move this project forward because it's projects like this one that will allow many of our carpenters to make a good living and continue a career with good wages and benefits. Thank you for your time and have a good night. Thank you. So I have 9116 as our last comment. Hi there, thank you very much for taking this time to hear from all of us and to look into this project. I appreciate the work that all of the presenters and commissioners have done for this meeting and for the project generally. Uh, I am sure the city staff are more knowledgeable than I am, but my understanding is that the parking uh, might exceed what is necessary for the building alone, but it, it's necessary to maintain just the existing level of parking downtown. Uh, and separate from whether or not it's required, I do want to encourage everybody to consider that people should not have to choose between keeping our cars and having housing. We do need parking spaces for our cars if we're going to live somewhere. I'm a student and worker here in Santa Cruz. It is so hard to find housing and projects like this are a great opportunity to take a step in the right direction with respect to housing justice. So. I just want to voice my appreciation for all of the work that everyone has put into this project. Thank you. All right, thank you. As as always, I appreciate our community's uh, comments, the amount of energy everybody's put into responding to this project. So thank you each and every one for making the time to tell us what you think. So I'll close the public hearing now. And then I kind of gathered up a list of seven items that I think uh, I, we should have staff respond to. Maybe I'll just read those off. And then, uh, Tim, if you agree, you could lead the show. Sure. Uh, I think it'd be pretty easy to show the shadow study on Cathcart. That's in the plans. Uh, gentleman had a question about that. That's to the south, so it should be a happy shadow study. Um, there's a question about low income employees in the district from that same gentleman at who lives across the street. And it was, I think how, if they can park in the garage across the way, um, we've been through it a million times, but could we say once more, how many new trees are being planted with the project? Um, total recap, but yeah, downtown parking district, are we adding parking spots or not? We've been through this a lot, but it doesn't hurt to say it one more time. Um, I, uh, architect could answer, Frank, if you don't mind, kind of how this building steps down to address the village height at Cedar and any other design features that meet the requirements of that plan. Um, wanted to ask the owner, Jim, if this like prevailing wage is required. Uh, I appreciate the unions, but I know that prevailing wage labor, labor can be costly as well, but just identify what's required already, if anything. And then uh, flash that unit mix to show off the different numbers of apartments, um, along with kind of a follow on about, are they designated for people with design, uh, developmental disabilities or not? Um, I have two children myself, so I feel the three bedroom need in the community. Um, Anyone else? Did I miss any commissioners? Did that pretty much get the highlights for you? Yeah, I, I would just add really quick. It, if, if staff could just once again clarify to the community how state law supersedes some of our local area plans, um, because that's something that we're going to see a lot. And if you could just you know, we don't have to go on and on about it, but just one more time, kind of talk talk us all through how, how that works and how state law supersedes a lot of these local plans we're kind of used to. Sure, thank you for that. Um, I think, uh, um, Sabrina, if you're on the line, if you can maybe speak to the hierarchy of legislation uh, at the state level versus uh, city municipal code. 
Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Good evening, Chair Kennedy and commissioners. I'm Sabrina Teller. I'm a partner with Remy Moose Manley. I'm outside uh, CEQA Council to the city on this and other projects. So you did hear the comments uh, expressing some confusion about the determination that the project is exempt uh, under an exemption that requires consistency with plans. And at the same time, the project is requesting a waiver and concessions from certain requirements of the zoning and plans. And so the way this works is, uh, you know, first you take the base project and that's the number of units that are allowed by the ordinary zoning and the plan. And then the city is required to grant a certain number or percentage of bonus units because of the affordable component of the base project. Um, but if restrictions and standards in that overlying planning and zoning would prohibit that number of base and bonus units from being constructed on the site, such as height restrictions, uh, for example, then the city is required also by the, the density bonus law to grant waivers and concessions uh, to to allow that project to be constructed. In other words, if it would present, if it would prevent the project from being built at the density plus that's required by law, then you're also required to grant waivers to the things that impede that number of units to be built. Um, and so this was dealt with in a case uh, several years ago called Walmer versus City of Berkeley where this very issue was presented. Um, the infill exemption that is applicable to this site, one of the couple of exemptions that's applicable to this site, requires consistency with applicable plans, policies, and zoning. And that case held that the mandatory mechanism in the state density bonus law renders those impeding restrictions inapplicable to the project. And therefore, there is no actual inconsistency and the exemption determination is therefore correct. And so for purposes of the consistency determination under CEQA, the, the CEQA exemption that's being claimed, those height restrictions are not applicable, essentially. So if you have any more questions on that, I'm happy to answer it, but. Uh, thank you, that was helpful. Great, oh, thanks so much, um, Sabrina. And I think, uh, Chair Kennedy, you had asked about um, the uh, presentation of the shadow study for the project. So I, I can go ahead and uh, share my screen here. So hopefully this is visible. Um, so this is, uh, uh, there's a couple of plan sheets that um, show and shadows. Yet, kind yeah. of, I don't oh, see that showing up. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. No worries. How, um, okay. Is that visible? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, so this is the, uh, the the shadow study that was prepared for the project. And of course, the winter solstice at nine in the morning is the most extreme uh, casting of shadows. And so the, the green here shows the impacts associated with worst case um, uh, casting of shadows at the, um, the point of the year at which they would be longest. And um, so this is the shortest day of the year. And so you can see that throughout the day, there are shadows cast, but they primarily fall onto adjacent public rights away. There's small parts of uh, the building here that will be potentially impacted to some degree by the shadows. Um, and throughout the day, this is, again is, is the most extreme case in the shortest day of the year. Um, there are generally not um, extreme uh, um, impacts. There are some to the uh, adjacent um, building here to the east along uh, Pacific Avenue. And um, another plan sheet shows this is the, the least impactful day of the year, summer solstice, and again throughout the day. So you can see that um, here there's really no impact at all. And so for most uh, points of the year, there would be impacts um, between summer solstice and winter solstice and um, uh, you know, uh, all things considered, um, the the height of the building in the location that's um, downtown, you know, adjacent to other buildings that are um, high, uh, tall, and so on, um, close proximity to one another, uh, the the impacts are not um, particularly high. I, I hope that answers the question. 
Yeah, that's great. Can you just point to Hula's while that's still up? I can see it, but a lot of people are just sure. used to looking at plans as me. Oh, that nice. looks like the sun will literally never touch Hula's. Yeah. I mean, the shadow, excuse me. R right. Yeah. This is, uh, let me try to zoom in here a little bit. Um, let's see. Sorry. Okay. Is that better? So, yeah, that looks yeah. good. Okay. Great. Yeah, again, this is worst case scenario, shortest day of the year, longest shadows um, that exist. Okay. And then I'd imagine that any employees could buy into the district parking. Right. Uh, Brian, would you like to, or Claire, perhaps um, you can respond perhaps, to that question. Yes. Yeah, and that, and my understanding of the question wasn't around parking, but priority for housing. And I, I might uh, ask Jim to speak to the housing allocation, because um, I believe that it was the intent of that question. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. We're uh, we're absolutely um, committed to to being a local preference uh, to the extent that we are not violating any fair housing laws. So what we've done on past projects is a, a tiered approach, is what um, through our legal counsel in conjunction with, you know, city uh, council. Uh, so it's essentially like a citywide for, you know, resident, citywide for employment, countywide for resident, countywide for employment. And you have to be very um, careful not to exclude any segments of the population. That, um, so but we are committed to that and um, we've done that in the past. Um, I'm happy to address uh, the uh, prevailing wage question as well if, if you would like um th this project yeah, will be great. Be subject okay great um this project absolutely will be subject to prevailing wage uh, most affordable projects are and um you know we are very familiar with that it is extremely uh rigid in terms of you know we hire consultants to audit uh to ensure that there is proper wage payment that is um, I'm not familiar with the projects that were cited, but I can tell you that we have a vested interest and in, and have a real uh, financial stake um, to ensure that that is followed. We're certifying that we are doing that, um, and we have been audited, and we we take it very seriously, and we do weekly with the payroll uh, to ensure that that does not happen. So. Um, I wanted to make sure that that was clear. It would be prevailing wage. We absolutely try to reach out to as many local contractors. Um, this type of project is a, you know, the type three construction, it, it is a very, um, uh, you know, specific, um, you know, type of construction. And so in the Santa Cruz market, we really, you know, try to find as much uh, in terms of local subcontractors, we're very active with reaching out um, in, in addition to the unions. I mean, my partner who's a contractor, he, he was a um, union carpenter himself, uh, you know, has taught unions, um, you know, and uh, carpenters union and whatnot. And so we absolutely uh, reach out and try to employ union labor wherever possible. We have on other projects, several, you know, union subs, and, and we would expect the same here um, to uh, really encourage as much um, competitiveness and, and skilled uh, trades as we can. I'm happy to. Um, any other questions? Great, thanks. That covered it for me. <clears throat> so I had uh, one more touch on trees, parking spots, and unit mix remaining. We can um, discuss the tree related questions. So um, I think uh, to answer most succinctly, um, the proposed uh, project would would necessitate the removal of all the trees on site none of them being heritage trees um, all would be replaced at uh, a minimum one-to-one -one ratio and in addition to that there has been expressed a um, desire to identify sites located off-site uh, to additionally accommodate um, up to a, a total number of 12 um, uh, trees for replacement so the idea would be that all trees removed would be replaced um, at a greater rate than than removed. And uh, additionally, um, of course, it's not the role of the commission tonight to 
make a decision related to the appeal of the heritage tree removal permit. However, it is notable that the landscape plans um, prepared for the project do include extensive new um, uh, foliage that would assist with um, offsetting the loss of any mature trees. And I, I think that probably answers it, but if there's additional questions or um, information that would uh, desired, I'd be happy to address those. No, that's good. It's clearly described in the Arborist report and the plans. So how about that unit mix? I love to see that one because we have two bedrooms and three bedrooms. Yay. Okay, I can uh, go ahead. Uh, if you like, I, I can share. And I think the the idea was to, to show the total number of units of different sizes, correct? Okay, so yeah, yeah I'll go ahead and share the project data. Um, I think that's actually in the PowerPoint. Let me quickly jump back to that. Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay. Sorry about the delay. I have it queued up. All right. Okay. And while you're pulling up the plans, I can just, I'll just describe the 124 unit mix so that you can like get that taken care of. But there's 31, three bedrooms, 31, two bedrooms, 48, one bedrooms, 13 studios, and one two bedroom manager's unit. And those are identified. Um, there is a matrix of the breakdown of of those um, and the plan set that was provided in the packet. Okay, and hopefully that my screen is uh, visible as well. It shows that. Yeah, so. thanks for putting that up. Um, and then how are the units for developmentally disabled allocated, Brian? Is that known at this point or be figured out later? If, um, Brian, yeah, I'll, let, I'll let Jim speak to, yeah, I don't, I'll, I'll let Jim speak to that aspect of things. Sounds good. Yeah, um, appreciate the question. We, we've, uh, this is not our first project working with um, developmentally disabled. And so we, we absolutely try to uh, provide units at different unit types. And uh, for example, Water Street, we have a mix of units and, you know, the Pacific Station South as well um, has a, a range. So that's something we would really work with uh, housing choices to try to come up with, you know, where the, the need is and um, put units at, at those. Um, but it, it most likely would be a range. So it hasn't been determined okay. exactly at this point. Thank you. Good. Well, I think that's all the questions unless anyone has anything else they want to have answered. I don't see anything. Uh, Claire, I see your hand. Yeah. Um, Chair Kennedy, you had asked one question about the parking supply and the overall parking. Oh, district. that's right. And yeah, this is just to confirm that with this project, there is a net loss of overall parking in the district. It's currently modeled at a net loss of 245 spaces district wide. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll, now we'll bring this back to the commission for discussion. Um, our meetings end at 11 unless we extend them and can everybody give me like a thumbs up, thumbs down on if you'd like a bathroom break, cause we could do a short recess. Um, so thumbs up would be yes, bathroom break or a thumbs down would be no quick poll. All right, let's finish it off then. Um, I really look forward to seeing you all in three dimensions next meeting without this delay. That's going to really help. Um, so I would encourage everybody to um, go ahead and, and tell us what you think about the project. If you want to add anything, if you want to find it, tune anything, this would be the time. I brought forward a few minor revisions and two big conditions, so we can do those at the end. And Tim, I trust you'll have the non-red line version ready. Thanks. All right, Mike, you're first. Well, I was just going to suggest that we hear the conditions of approval first, but if you want to do them last, then no problem. Uh, I'd be happy to do them first. Oh. Well, just point of order. I, I think we need a, a motion to approve the staff 
recommendations and the conditions, and, and then we would need to make a modification to those conditions, is I think how we need to go. I can tell you've been a practice chair and I'm new to the seat. Thank you again. Uh, does anyone have a motion on this project? Uh, chair, uh, Commissioner Conway. I can't hear you. Julie, you're, oh, on Julie, you're muted. Sorry about that. I was flipping screens a little bit too fast and I will have more comments after we get a motion on the floor. Um, but I would like to move that the planning commission recommend to the city council acknowledgement of the environmental determination, approval of the non-residential demolition authorization permit, the special use permit, the design permit and the lot line adjustment to demolish the existing surface parking lot and structures and construct the library affordable housing project based on the findings listed um, below and possibly as amended and conditions of approval listed in exhibit A of the staff report dated February 15th, 2023. I'll second. Uh, moved by Conway, seconded by Ms. C.D. Miller. Thank you both. Um, so I'll throw those conditions out at first, if that's fine with everybody. I just didn't want to go first because of being chair. Um, so Tim, do you want to bring those up? There were three kind of fine tuning minor ones. And, um, so maybe we'll look at those first. So start down there on commission 34. This is a condition that exempts mechanical equipment, et cetera, from the height limit. State law means that, uh, says that solar panels can exceed this already. But I wanted to add these words that bifacial solar panels are specifically exempted from this condition. Uh, bifacial solar panel collects solar energy from both sides. And so some of the big buildings I'm working on in my daily work, doing this work, want to go higher with a trellis to get enough PV produ production up there. And particularly if there's a mechanical screen already, it doesn't cost very much more to do that sometimes. So this is not a requirement. It's already state law, but I wanted to put it in there just to let this project know that that might be something they can explore. Again, the state energy code requires so much PV for this type of building, solar panels, that it's literally really hard to get enough on the roof. So this would give them a slight incentive to do that. It's kind of a soft one, it's not a big deal. Um, any questions, comments for me on that one? Okay, number 50 is just tidying up a typo. There's kind of like three hey. conditions where, yeah? Um, Cindy had a had, has her hand up. Oh, I didn't notice that, Cindy? Yeah, Thanks, I just uh, I just would really appreciate seeing a red line because I'm very confused about what we're adding and what we're not like what are new and what are just going to be additions to the existing conditions. So is there a red line version of this we can look at? The red line contains like all mine uh, back and forth. So no. And um, I don't okay, know if so, we blow, so <laughs> blow up number 34. So this would be adding the words bifacial okay. solar panels are specifically exempted to that condition. Sure. Okay, yeah, if you could just say that as you're going through, that would just be really helpful. Like, yeah, you totally. Just want to add these words to number 34, that totally exactly. helps me. Yeah. Okay, adding those words for 34. Number 50 is an existing condition that is unchanged. It's just kind of three conditions got mushed together there. So staff agreed to separate them out for clarity. And then what's my third one there, Tim? I think it's over on the right. Oh, there's two more actually, 52. We talked about this earlier, bikes of different, this is the um, uh, bike storage condition. And if everyone likes it, I'd love to add these words that say bikes of different sizes and charging of e-bikes shall be considered in the design. It's pretty soft, it's happening already, but we want our bike rooms to be awesome. 
Number 57 is just, again, a small ad of that language. It lists out all these different like operations and maintenance manuals that are required for various purposes. And the Cal Green Green Code also requires that both the residents and the maintenance staff are given a specific manual on how to keep the green features of the building running. So I just thought we'd list that out along with everything else and staff happily agreed. All right, any, everybody all right with those minor ones? Let me know if you have questions, want to talk more. Um, good, so the two kind of big new conditions I was working on um, the first one's a big deal. Uh, as chair, I'm allowed to create an ad hoc committee of the planning commission. And so I want to hear from you if you think this is a good idea or not. My concern is that because this is a civic project that we have a bit more oversight of like streetscapes and finishes than we normally do. We've done this before years ago. Um, so the basic idea is to appoint an ad hoc committee of a few volunteers from the commission, and then staff could call them in if any changes to materials are proposed uh, between now and building permit submittal or after that. And on previous uh, commissions, we've had architects and talented people on the commission, and it was actually a help to the developer and staff to kind of circle back to a subcommittee without obviously having to go all the way back through the planning commission for something. So these were the words that I hammered out with staff uh, to establish that subcommittee and I'd be asking for volunteers and interest and uh, I'd like to hear what the other commissioners think if you think this is a good idea, too much, too little. I, I guess, um, so thank you for bringing it up and I, I, I'm trying to make sure the words um, jive with what I think the intent is. Um, are you really looking for kind of a sounding board to for um, changes that might evolve as the um, project gets closer to drawings? Um, so it doesn't need to go all the way back through approvals it's really meant to be a sounding board for revisions um, or yes. what is that what you intend? So we're not, we're not adding a layer. We're not, um, we're not, you know, forcing additional review. We just are, are trying to be a place to um, make sure that the, uh, you know, as the final evolution of the project moves forward, um, that there is um, discussion by um, this subcommittee. Um, is, that, is, that, is that what you're talking about? Yes. And uh, Tim, look at this now. We had already struck those last two sentences, so just delete those, I believe, on our last version. Um, so Julie, to respond to you, yes, the like referred back to the planning commission words, I would think that nobody would want to do that so I was kind of thinking this would give an incentive to the little subcommittee to work things out with staff and owner. Um, in no case do I want this project mm -hmm. to come back all the way through the process. Yeah. And um, I really trust the design team and I trust staff to do this, but there's, these are, this is a big important building and I just want everything to look really good and us to go into it with eyes wide open with what we're getting. And it's the nature of the process that that changes. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, and I and I think especially if the if the developers are in favor of this further discussion, if if they would find that helpful, um, I can see how it could be. I am concerned that um, this would make it appear that an approval is in any way conditional, because I'm concerned that that's going to be a um, a cloud on an application for financing. I want to make sure that that is that that's clear. That that the, the approval, um, you know, when it's granted by the city council, 
um, isn't mushy. Yeah. Uh, Cindy, I see your hand, and then maybe we'll just ask, ask the applicant how they feel about this, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear the intent, but but I just feel that it, it it's adding a, a, too much ambiguity and kind of a, a, a new part to a process where, you know, we're, we've had this very extensive public process, very clear that it's a very central project. There's a lot of eyes on this. The design team is well aware of that. The project has changed significantly based on feedback. Um, it, it's a really high quality, um, being built to the higher standards, um, you know, while taking in all, all the requirements. And I, I just feel like it, it's, it's too much and we don't really need that. Um, uh, there's just a lot of eyes on this project. There has been, and there will be. And I, I just, I just don't think we need to add another layer to it. Okay. Uh, can we hear from the applicant? What do you think of this idea? Well, I, I definitely understand the, um, appreciate the, the concern, um, but I, I definitely would echo uh, Commissioner um, Conway's comments, and I think she's very in tune with uh, the challenges and just the potential uh, in terms of what a funding source may look like. I, I think that to the, anytime we're deviating from what the established, um, you know, because currently if we were to, to propose something that was not in line, planning would check conformance um, with the entitlement. If there was a major de design modification, it would go back through the channels. It's more of a prescribed, it's not a kind of specific, and I, not just the agencies were applying for funding, but also when the investors and the lenders that are potentially, you know, were working with, I, that's that's my only concern. I, I get the intention and I don't know how um, we could provide you the assurance other than we understand how you know critical this project is. And I think this is gonna be um, uh, something where, you know, through the, the I'll call them the, the established metric of, of what that process would be, I think, um, you know, maybe it, it could be something that was Kind of unofficial. I, I sure would welcome the mm -hmm. um, the uh, feedback, and I agree that the you know the project is made better through uh, the participation. I feel like this this project has morphed so much from where we started to such a you know a, a better project now. But um, I, I am concerned about layering something that would deviate from the traditional process. Um, mm -hmm. To be candid. Okay. So. Anyone else have thoughts or comments on this one? I would say that I appreciate the, the sentiment too. Um, I think we're on the same page, you know, about our concerns, you know, with a project mm -hmm. of this scale. Um, but um, I also would like to believe that, you know, everybody knows that, you know, I'm a resource, we're a resource, and that is as equally as important. So if we have a kind of a friendly agreement that that we're all in this together, then um, you know, mm -hmm. then I feel good about that. So, but thank you for bringing it to mm -hmm. the table. Well, thanks, uh, Mark. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair Kennedy. Uh, my sense, I, I agree somewhat with um, Commissioner Dawson on this. I, I'm a little concerned about adding another layer to a process that's process intensive. Um, I'm a little concerned about the, um, as uh, the owner, um, uh, owner's rep, uh, Mr. Rendler pointed out that, you know, it's, it can add complications to a process uh, with unforeseen circumstances. I'm a little concerned about the word highest possible quality um, of streetscape and finish, but these are, these are all kind of loaded words that can be misinterpreted or subject to interpretation and argument. And you know, um, my my sense is that staff is fully capable of you know making the kinds of uh, judgments needed. Um, and yeah, and as um, Commissioner Gordon pointed out, there's there's plenty of you know resource available in, in the community, and everyone's aware of it. So I, I think this is an unnecessary condition, but 
I do appreciate the, the intent, Pete. You're uh, okay. to do it the best way possible. So I appreciate that about you. Sounds good. So let's withdraw this condition. I hear you. I don't want to create any sort of loophole. And uh, Mr. Rendler, if you want to invite us to a meeting to touch samples and check in, uh, please do. But we won't require you to do it. I, I would be happy and, to do that. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, and we all know, you know, we're all going to see the building too. Um, I understand value engineering, but, you know, there have been several projects that came out really disappointing compared to what we saw at, at the commission. So I'll just state that and we'll withdraw this commission. Tim, thanks again for uh, putting the work in there. And I see Samantha's hand. Hi, thank you, Chair Kennedy. Um, you know, given the importance of this project, and I'm, I'm hearing the discussion here around this first condition um, and some of the challenges that it brings, but, um, you know, given the importance of the project and the design, also one option might be that we could um, evaluate any changes that are proposed to the exterior design of the building when it comes in at the building permit stage and then bring that back to the commission just as an informational item. Um, and sure. then you could see what was being proposed and any commissioners, you know, may be able to reach out to us individually uh, with any concerns that they have. That sounds great. That'd Let's do great. that unless anyone objects. Cool. All right, well, we'll drop that one. Thank you all for uh, listening to the idea. So this is the last new condition I'd like to approve. Um, my general concern here is that apartment dwellers who have electric vehicles are allowed the opportunity to charge overnight, like people who have single family homes are. So I worked this language out with staff and everybody. Um, I understand that the residential units don't have any actual parking in the garage due to state law, but I do feel like we should provide a few more than normal electric vehicle chargers there. So the condition I'm proposing is that exclusive of the parking spaces allocated the library fitness center and daycare, 25 parking spaces shall be provided with a level two electric vehicle charging station before occupancy. 99 additional parking spaces shall provide the electrical capacity to add level one chargers in the future. And so where did I come up with these numbers? I looked at Mountain View, which has the strongest regulations, you know, in the Bay Area that I'm aware of, and knocked those down a fair bit. But kind of here's my math was that there'd be 124 residential units and 20% of those 25 spaces would be installed. If this was a purely residential project, which it's not, we'd be requiring 12% installed already. So it's just boosting it up from 12 to 20 and basing it on the number of units. Um, in an ideal world, we don't need electric vehicles because we're all moving to transit bikes, everything else, but we're gonna have this transition period. And in an ideal world, I demand that every parking spot is EV capable because that's what I think needs to happen. But I think this is a just a small push to add a few extra spots day one and then make sure the garage has the capacity, you know, for 99 more down the road. Um, a level one charger is like a regular 110 plug. So this will cost a little bit extra money. I'd like to hear from the applicant if they could live with it. Um, and this is the last condition I'm approving, or I'm proposing, excuse me. So I think Claire and then Mark. Hi, Chair Kennedy. Yeah, I am fine with this. This is um, something that the parking district can definitely work on and having additional EV parking capacity within the downtown is very needed. My one suggestion would be to strike the first part of this exclusive of parking spaces allocated to the library, fitness center and daycare. 
Um, I definitely read that as exclusive parking for those uses, and I don't want that to ever oh. be misconstrued mm-hmm. that not all parking is unbundled. Um, you know, years down the road when we're all gone and um, and that happens. Yep. So as, aside from that, I think the condition is appropriate, especially being very forward looking for how long we are looking forward to this building being there. Thanks, that's a good clarification. Uh, Commissioner Mercedes Miller. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Chair Kennedy. I, I I like the condition. I was going to ex- say exactly the same thing that Clara said. So I'll just second what she had to say. I, I don't think we should be um, excluding uh, any spaces uh, from level two charging. Um, I do also want to question whether or not level one chargers are really useful. Um, I've owned an electric vehicle now for 10 years and level one charging, I did it once and it was unbelievably painful and slow and basically useless. Um, so I, I I really can't support it. Frankly, I just can't support adding level one charging. It's, uh, it's a waste of, uh, it's a waste of capacity. Um, so that, those are my thoughts on, on that condition. But I like I like the idea of having okay. a level two charger out, out of the gate. And so just to be clear, it, it would just be to have the capacity for future level one, uh, not install nothing installed now. I understand, but the yep. no reason to have the capacity if the charging is not useful. Sounds okay. good. Thank uh, you. Cindy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I, I would just want to um, respectfully disagree with um, Commissioner Missy Miller. I think we are going to be in this transition for longer than people want or think. I think as far as cars being, um, you know, part of a lot of people's day to day transit needs, and um, you know, level one charging overnight for some of the vehicles with shorter range or plug-in hybrids is not that painful and, you know, pretty, you know, legitimate with the amount of time it takes. It certainly could happen overnight on a 110. Um, And so I I think it's nice to just have the option to throw a few in there if it becomes a need. Um, Again, we're not putting all the plugs in now, but running the wires so they're there. I don't know. I I think if we're going to do it, we might as well do it. We don't need it. But, you know, I, I just adding the add additional cost of running wires now that we may or may not actually put an outlet on doesn't seem like something we should preclude. I think we, sh- I think it's fine as written. So I, 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 just for the record, I support all the conditions that will likely be made a motion here by Commissioner Kennedy at some point. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, um, I see your hand there, Mike. I just wanted to... No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, just in the interest of, of moving this forward um, and, you know, this really not being my wheelhouse in terms of the capacity of, you know, installing for future use level one and level two electric vehicle charging stations, um, is it possible to add language in which we say something like, you know, 99 additional parking spaces of either level one or level two capable infrastructure is installed in the future or something like that just a suggestion to move this forward Mm -hmm. that's a good idea you know i think uh, i talked to an electrical engineer i work with in my day job about this we're working on a mountain view project and he said like yeah level one you can add a bunch of them and it's not going to have big effects on the transformer so i think adding level level two is like a 220 you know faster charge so I think that would actually make it a bit more scary, but I do appreciate the thought. Um, could I hear from the applicant what they think about the EV charging condition, if it's too much, too little? I, I don't even know who owns that parking garage, actually, but whoever does, tell me. <laughs> Claire already did. All right, good. <laughs> yeah, um, the parking component of this project would come and be financed by the parking district. We do have EV parking in other locations in the district. Not um, having experience in the electrical side of this, I can't speak to the loads that would be different between level one and level two. They'll all work it out uh, uh, moving ahead, is my opinion. Uh, Claire, one other thing while you're on is that 
like it would be up to the parking district who gets these chargers and it could theoretically be like a revenue generator for you all you know because we can't designate them for the apartments they'll just be there but i mean i don't know how those blink stations work but i'm sure someone's making some money along the way somewhere yeah i mean ideally one of the um the great things about this project is that there's the opportunity for these to be used 24 hours a day um if people who are coming downtown to maybe go to the gym in the morning people who are dropping their kids off at the child care center, people who are then, you know, working downtown during the day and the people who live there overnight. So it's a really high opportunity for efficiency of use of each of these spaces and each of these uh, charging facilities. Cool. And then I would point out that if you're building this parking garage in Mountain View, like I know we don't have Google here to pay for all this, and they do, but um, they would be requiring uh, at least one DC fast charger, which is a huge expense. So um people are doing this and i think we should just bump it a little bit brian thank you commissioner kennedy i just wanted to give uh frank baxter a chance to talk maybe from the design team about load and capabilities because he had his hand up and i don't know if, the, if it was his notice um, thank you frank At least I can hear. You, you know, I, th I think, it's, Brian, that could have been an accident. Still on? I'm accident. sorry. Okay. I, I think that was an accident. I wanted to make sure. I'm still on, okay, sorry. Perfect. It, oh. it looks like the host just needed to unmute me. Yeah, I think for Jim Rendler is in my point, just uh, as the applicant, um, yeah, I mean, the electrical code is is quickly catching up to the EV requirements that we're seeing in development codes and such like that. I think in the parking garage application, just the concentration of load, um, you know, we have to think about that every level two charger is the equivalent of a 220 wash machine or dryer, you know, and, um, and so a lot of the codes that we're seeing, you know, for development have to do with residential type applications where they are on separate meters and separate um, separate transformers and such. And so we do have a transformer room. It's on the ground floor. It's very large for this size building. Um, but so I, I guess without being, you know, super savvy on the very current electrical code as it results on EV chargers, um, that would be my only hesitation of, of just of whether or not a condition can be made and not be overly onerous to um, to a to a project just in terms of realisticness of either, you know, like if the project has to install, for instance, a second transformer, uh, the scale, as you know, is a very, very large. So um, I don't think it's the 25, you know, is not where I get concerned. It would be, you know, uh, not not to say the 99 level ones, as you all pointed out, is, is a concern, but I think that may just be before you put a commission in potentially needing to get reference from the current electrical code in terms of what concentration of a level twos on a single service uh, and and how that how that can be done would be uh, would be, be appreciated from the applicants I guess so yeah I think you know we can fit them in you know uh, the conduits can be run all that stuff but uh, yeah it's the it's the overall trickle effect. Uh, of providing for those. And then I guess the last thing mm -hmm. with the level ones is um, I could go either way with their efficiency or, or, or such. I do have challenges sometimes with conditions that are providing for future because of not knowing what the landscape will be in let's say five years when or 10 years when we want to put those in and i've done projects that have done future type things and sure enough in 10 years when you're like let's put the chargers in level ones don't even exist anymore we got to pull all level twos and then all the one inch conduits are too small and they need to be too you know and that type of yeah uh, yep. providing for future is um is is risky uh, just because it, it may not be what is the right thing so that's all i have to add so it's things mm -hmm. i know you're all considering but um, a condition of approval that yeah uh, hasn't been fully vetted with the electrical code could be concerning so so these are really good comments i mean it's the age of all electric buildings so these electrical rooms are just getting tremendous you know we've got all sorts of stuff in there now um 
that being said, this is the only way I'm going to get at like the 65% of our carbon footprint, which is driving cars around. So this building is crushing it in every other area, right? Walkability, density, it's downtown, it's tall, it's small, it's got bikes, it's got everything. So that's why I want to stick to my guns here and put this in. And then, of course, uh, you would have the opportunity between now and council to get some more advice about this. And then you can always petition back to the director if it really, really becomes onerous. My professional judgment is that it won't, based on my experience with a lot of projects. So um, I'd like to stick with these words and go ahead with the vote if everyone's comfortable with that, or if there aren't any more comments. Just a point of order, uh, Commissioner Kennedy, Chair Kennedy. So you would need to make a motion, get a second, and then we vote these new conditions as an amendment to the motion on the floor. Am I allowed to make a motion for new conditions or does someone else have to? You are not. <laughs> Somebody else needs to make it. I'll right, move. Anybody got my back? I'll move all the conditions of approval. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll second with the clarification that we move these new conditions along with the existing conditions um, w with these modifications. So I, I second that. Accepted. Thank you. All right, um, exciting moment. Uh, Tess, are ready for a roll call vote? Any other comments, discussion? Julie. I just want to be clear on what we're voting on right now. I think what we're voting on is um, amending the, the motion on the floor to include these further further um, conditions of approval. We're not voting on the motion itself. Correct? Correct. Yes, that's correct. Ready for me? Yep, we're ready. Okay. Um, Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Gordon? Aye. Maxwell? Maxwell? Aye. C.D. Miller? Aye. Paul Himmis? Aye. Kennedy. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Conway. Thank you. Somehow I lost my little hand. Um, thank you for that. So now we have a motion on the floor. Um, I just want to make an additional comment um, about the child care program and the, the child care center. First of all, it's wonderful to see it in there. We, it, it's definitely needed. Um, I am concerned about its size. Um, I know that um, urban child care centers can do remarkable things with um, smaller outdoor space. That's why community care licensing allows it. Um, and that's fine. My concern is that um, the child care space um, that that it doesn't get so small that it's not viable um, to operate. Um, and um, Jim, I'm sure you've worked on um, housing with childcare um, where there's a mismatch. And um, I appreciate staff, I talked to staff today about this issue and it's really important to be working with um, a childcare operator who really has understanding on the ground about what's gonna be viable. Um, and I'm glad that you're continuing to do that. I'm really interested in where you end up with that. Um, and I also um, really support what Cindy um, talked about earlier, which was um, if there are evolutions in the project that allow for some additional space, this would be a great place to do it. Um, so thank you for including it. Thank you for um, working on it. I know it's I know it's always challenging, but boy, do we ever need it, and it makes this building even more um, attractive. So I don't want to change. I don't want to require anything. I just am um, noting that um, 
operational viability is a key issue when you're talking about um, child care programs. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Mike, your hands up. I think Commissioner Dawson was first. Oh, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Dawson. Thanks. Um, and just um, to plus one, I guess Julie, uh, Commissioner Conway plus one to what I said, and I'll plus one back to what she said. I just, again, I'm not going to introduce a condition, but I, I, you know, the the child care area is 643 square feet or something. I live in a house smaller than that, and imagining 17 uh, kids uh, wanting to run around and get some of their energy out in that kind of space. Um, you know, we want to make sure that it's viable. I do have concerns that we've moved forward and child care licensing doesn't approve hacking the outdoor space. And then we have a child care center that's not going to be viable to run because the economics are going to not, not work out for the provider. So anything we can do to increase that outdoor space would be great. I do want to um, also just recognize uh, the union members who spoke and encourage them to go directly to the council and um, continue to talk about project labor agreements and local hire requirements for all city projects. That would something that would, the council would decide on. And um, I think that's something that's sorely needed. Um, it, it is great to hear that prevailing wage is gonna be part of this project. And I will wrap up with, I would like to introduce um, an additional con uh, condition for consideration. And um, this is just based on, on Again, this transition period that we're going to be in for cars, uh, it's based on the fact that the downtown is still recovering from COVID um, and recovering our business activities in the downtown area. And there are jobs downtown, but there is not enough jobs for everybody downtown. So it's likely that some of these low income residents for all of this dense development downtown are going to be working elsewhere. Um, we continue to improve our transit systems, but cars are going to be part of service working jobs for likely the foreseeable future. Um, you know, those jobs don't have the flexibility that a lot of professional jobs have where you can uh, work on your schedule. You know, if you have a shift that starts at nine o'clock, you need to be there. And if a bus doesn't get you there, you're going to need a car. So um, with all that, all of the development going downtown, I'd like to introduce a condition and I'll go slow. Um, I would like to introduce a condition that 25% of the total stalls, whatever that number ends up being, in the parking garage in the 113-119 Lincoln Street project um, would be available to any um, resident in an affordable housing unit in the downtown area on a first-come, first-served basis at no cost. So I'll read it one more time. 25% of the total stalls in the parking garage in the 113-119 Lincoln Street be available to any affordable housing unit resident in the downtown area footprint on a first come first serve basis at no cost. So that's a motion I have on the floor for a condition and I would be looking for a second. And looks like um, staff might have something to say about that. Yeah, Claire Globley, my primary well, concern. Well, Claire, let's see if we have a second first. Oh. Yeah, I'll definitely. I'd like to hear. I'm. I'll second it just to hear what the what the options are here because I think it's important. Claire. Yeah. Thank you. So Claire Globley with Public Works. Um, a couple of key concerns with this. The first is that restricting parking in the shared public supply, if it were to be financed by the parking district, is incongruent with the charge of the district. It would be parking that would be restricted for a certain segment of downtown rather than open and shared, which gets away from our shared parking framework and the lower parking ratios that we have downtown. So first concern is that, that I, I don't know that the parking district would be able to uh, need to, to research more on that. Uh, the second point is that the one of the beauties of the shared parking model that we have downtown is that it's used by all different uses at all types at all times of day. And I call this um, 
pancakes, pottery, pints, and peanuts is the educational term I use for it. So people can come downtown in the morning and go get breakfast at Walnut Avenue Cafe, park in a parking spot. They leave. Someone else comes down with their kids. They park in that same parking spot, and they go to Petroglyph to paint some pottery. They leave. Someone else comes downtown to go to Lupolo and grab a drink, and they park in that same parking spot. It's the third use that day. They leave, and finally a resident comes home and parks in that same parking spot the fourth time it's used that day to sleep in their home overnight. When you do restrict parking to a single use, you are limiting the efficiency of that parking space and getting away from the overall benefits that we have of the shared parking system. Uh, the condition you're putting forth is something that I would strongly, strongly recommend against. I would um, really be happy to work with commission on input for what we could do for low-income permit programs in the future, which I think could meet the intent of what you're getting at there. But I would strongly, strongly, strongly oppose restricting parking to any singular use because it really does get away from the, the efficiency and the shared model. And I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Uh, Julie? Yeah, thanks. And I appreciate the intent um, behind it, but I, um, Claire said it better than I would have. Um, it breaks um, the whole premise of having shared uses throughout the day and it makes it not work. Um, uh, and it, perhaps if there is something down the road, a way to um, you know, accommodate um, low-income households accessing parking. But the whole idea when you um, match parking like this is that it's daytime, nighttime uses and it's not an exclusive use. Um, so um, appreciate the intent but I would hope that we can find another way to address that need. Uh, Cindy, for a response. Yeah, just really quickly. Um, there's lots of different ways you can do this. One of one of the reasons that um, I didn't say that it was just for that building is because people have varying schedules, and if you look at the number of units that we are creating downtown, and the, the amount of those units that have affordability associated with them, um, a, a permit program or a, or a cost-based program is not going to be really feasible for a lot of folks. And so um, I, I very much worry that we are continuing to just increase density and build affordable housing, which we absolutely need, but we're, we're not thinking of uh, those residents as a holistic person that has needs like um paying the rent and so parking parking is part of that and space is really something we don't have a lot of so if we continue to just build out these things and we're not being very thoughtful about this in the beginning i, I think it's going to be very hard to claw back and i'm certainly not an expert in this area um but um from what i know right now this was kind of the easiest and most straightforward. Um, I, I hear the concerns, but I'm gonna stick to my guns on it. So, um, you know, if others don't have comments, we can just go to a vote so we can move along. Any other comments? All right, Tess, uh, please do a roll call vote on Cindy's proposed uh, condition. Commissioner Conway? <laughs> no. Uh, Dawson? Yes. Gordon? No. Maxwell? Aye. Ms. C.D. Miller? No. Wilhelmus? No. Kennedy? No. All right, uh, Commissioner Wilhelmus? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Kennedy. Um, I just want to, as sort of my closing comment for the night um, with a motion on the floor in a second, I just want to say uh, how glad I am that this project is before us and to watch the evolution of this project change over the last several years. Um, it's really been just a joy to watch this, this project improve and improve and improve from going from uh, an extremely large parking garage and a library to then 
an affordable housing project, to then have a child care center, to then have a commercial center, and all these different changes that were made. Um, I just want to commend the the city staff and uh, the development team for making this project such just a cool addition to the downtown core. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to seeing this this uh, project go forward. So that's where I'm at, and I'll, I'll leave my comments there. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tim Marie? Hi. Um, I completely agree with um, Commissioner Paul Hamas. Um, I'm very excited about this project. I um, look forward to being a resource to the, both the city and the design team as they move forward with design development. Um, and so please, you know, use me as a resource. Um, we've been doing design and in this area for a very long time. So, um, and with that, I would, <laughs> if you're open to it, I'd like to make a friendly amendment <laughs> to um, uh, or a condition of approval for the um, the venting and, and commercial um, infrastructure that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I'd like to just use the motion that we used at the last meeting, um, uh, that all commercial spaces shall be constructed to support a future food service use. Um, all ducting and venting should be designed to be hidden or incorporated into the building design and plans shall also show the locations of grease traps, grease lines and grease storage facilities. Um, I am tempted to also mention garbage, just, you know, or, you know, trash because there are trash uh, enclosures um, mentioned in the plans for both the library and residential, but it doesn't go as far to mention it for this particular commercial space. And so um, I just, I totally trust that the design team will handle this. And I heard loud and clear that design development has not um, been, you know, fully completed yet, but I also know that um, it should be something that we need to make sure is included so that these buildings really are as flexible as possible. So if you're open to it, I'd like to add that. I'll second that. I, I, yeah. And Tim Ray, I found if you like keep proposing it again and again, eventually it'll make it into the standard word doc, you know, it <laughs> might take some time. Any other discussion of that uh, proposed condition? Just call it the Timory motion, man. That's it. So it's not really a motion. This is something where she asked for a friendly amendment so the maker and the second would agree and it would be oh. incorporated. That's Good point. I can agree. Should I change to something? I'm new at this. Did it fine. Okay. <laughs> so do, does the maker and the second of the motion agree to the friendly amendment? I'd like to make sure the developer is comfortable with this. This yeah. is the same language we approved last time. Um, but but otherwise, yeah. Yeah, I'm comfortable with it. Frank, with Jim, do you have any comments? Uh, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, the only challenge I've run into with this in my career has just been uh, the level of smoke, fire, damp. I'm sorry, I'm tripping on my words. It's a little late. <laughs> but the um, the the how commercial the commercial kitchen is able to go. So like coffee shops don't require that. Um, certain restaurants do, depending on the level of grease. And so. Um, I've done a lot of chases for future that allow for restaurants. And so it's just determining if there's a certain level that it's going to be set to. Um, and then just a reminder that we have a occupied um, roof deck for the library on top of all of the commercial. So, um, and then I have a, a lot of clearances associated with all of the residential operable windows. So uh, right. it's not that it can't be done, but um, it's not uh, quite as flexible as uh, a lot of commercial spaces. So I think providing for grease traps, for item for coffee shops um, and, uh, and smaller restaurants and such. But uh, yeah, uh, if it's a full grease hood and all the chases and, and fire suppression to do with that, um, a little bit tighter in terms of this project. Not that it can't be done, but just kind of that's the, the limitations I've seen on, on I'm providing for uh, future uses in that area. So. Thank you for that. If, if I could add to that too, uh, Frank, thanks for that. Um, I, I think we need to be practical with the amount of space that we're really talking about where there could, you know, be a, uh, it would 
be a ground floor use, right? And you know, the the reality is that space is not really going to be a large format restaurant that would require all that. It most likely would be a small coffee shop. So I think that's important to keep in mind. And you know, it's also adjacent to a daycare. That so I, I think we want to be aware of that. But we absolutely are committed to to um, you know, maintaining the, the best flexibility for the city goals. And that's just something that I think flows through a lot of the comments that were heard tonight. This is a little different than just a project where we're developing it as, you know, just a, uh, without any kind of city partnership. This is going to be really entwined in, in the fact that the city is retaining that. It's going to be in, in the project's best interest, the city's venture, best interest to make those decisions. So. I, I'm not trying to shy away from it. I just think I kind of echo putting anything that's too overly formalized without really knowing kind of economic development, what they, you know, really see as a good fit for that space. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Am I allowed to say anything? <laughs> I think <laughs> <I'm> just, okay. <laughs> um, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I, I think in this particular instance, I mean, um, you know, maybe that I, I, I understand that the chase is going to be complicated, which is partially why I was bringing it up as if it's not thought of now, it's never going to be possible. And if as the, you know, economic development, the city is actually the, you know, decision maker on this, then they can settle with that. But I, the coffee shop is going to need a grease interceptor. And so I think that that, needs to be factored in certainly and de definitely garbage um and and then ult ultimately i just want it to you know as commissioner kenny said earlier just eyes wide open you know that this is that that there's going to be a decision made here um on how flexible the space is going to be and um it's going to be you know there's going to be a limitation and a chase yeah for a restaurant full hood is is one thing but you know somebody like petroglyph who needs to vent you know their ceramics kilns you know also will have challenges so it's just something that needs to be discussed and, and considered so i'm willing to give up the chase in this particular instance because i know it's going to be challenging but i think the grease interceptor and garbage is going to be um, critical and how they get to that so that seems like a good compromise. I just want to back uh, Timory up and say stick to your guns. I mean, th that precludes ever having a restaurant in there if you don't plan for this a little bit, in my understanding. So uh, I, I'd be all right to drop the, the chase. Uh, Commissioner Masidi Miller. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with dropping the chase requirement as well. So we'll uh, assume the friendly amendment has been amended. Sweet. Julie, you're all right with that? Yeah, so if I if I understand it, um, as the maker of the motion, we are going to, we, we want maximally flexible space in the future for unknown needs. We also want to acknowledge that it is already um, tight and um, by virtue of its limited size it, and um, what's all around it, it comes with it with some limitations. So we're asking for um, that we're going to go ahead with the language as proposed, but it is going to be without the chase. Um, but we're asking the developers to um, have their radar up um, for long-term flexibility of the of the space um, by the language as you suggested. Yeah, I can go with that. All right, uh, Jim. I see your hand is up. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. I apologize, Commissioner Gordon. I didn't um, mean to to not uh, look for feedback there. I yeah, I, I don't think that's problematic, and I I okay. I do maintain that we are, you know, really working with the city, and I encourage you know Brian and um, economic development. It you know I, I see this as something that um, the grease and the garbage is definitely something that we are already planning to want to implement. So okay. I was mostly just asking permission because I'm a new commissioner and I didn't want to speak out of line. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you. Uh, commissioner Masidi Miller. Uh, thank you, Chair Kennedy. I just wanted to make uh, a couple of remarks uh, before we go to a vote. Um, 
I am in agreement with uh, many of the supportive comments uh, my fellow commissioners have made, and I won't repeat those, but I did want to uh, point out one thing uh, that uh, members of the public had brought up, and that uh, has to do with the Cedar Village um, feeling. And um, in reflecting on those comments, um, my sense is that I can't think of a better sort of uh, neighborhood facing uh, use or function than a public library. And so I think that the way this project has been designed with the public library facing the neighborhood, um, I really think it's a fine uh, transition between the, uh, the neighborhoods to the west and our downtown. So um, I am ready to support this project. Thank uh, you. Commissioner Conway. Thank you. Um, I also am ready to support this project, but I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank the librarians. Um, there's a lot of people to thank the Downtown Library Advisory Committee, certainly city staff and the project team. But um, I feel like um, I know for me personally, as a single parent in the 80s and 90s, I don't know what I would have done without the library and the librarians. And I am really excited um, that we're moving towards providing space for, um, you know, the people of this community going forward. And I want to thank everybody who's worked on it. Thank you. Any other closing comments? Well, I guess it's my turn. This is an amazing night. Uh, the years of work that have gone into this project from everybody are remarkable and fantastic. Uh, Julie, I would not have survived and become who I am without the public libraries. I mean, I spent hours in them, and I think I read every book in the Galt one when I was young. So even better, I have young kids who will enjoy this library, and that's just fantastic. So I could, I will not get the whole list, but Tim, thank you for your good work, and especially all my last-minute calls and things um, today. All of staff has been very supportive. Uh, the design team, thank you. Um, Abe, Jason, particularly, your work on the existing libraries is incredible. And there's no designer I trust more to take this forward and make it an incredible space for our town. So uh, I appreciate the work you've done and the work to come. That's just great. And then uh, Jim Rendler, I know it takes a lot of work to get these things done. I remember when I met you on another affordable housing project that had kind of forgotten during construction to put their renewable energy systems on. And uh, ever since then, Jim has taken care of every detail that I know of in a very admirable way. So I'm just touching the surface. Thank you all. Incredible work. And uh, I have the honor of uh, calling for a vote on this project. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Dawson. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Maxwell. Aye. C.D. Miller. Aye. Paul Hemis. Aye. Kennedy. Uh, aye. Woo woo. All right. Well, that's the end of our special meeting, I think. Um, I will now adjourn the commission. And uh, thanks, everybody, for your time tonight. Stay dry.